I'm Bill Bassett. I'm a senior associate director in the Division of Financial Stability at the Board of Governors. And I'm also a member of the Model Oversight Group, which is responsible for the development and implementation of the models used in the Federal Reserve Stress Test Program. I will be popping up on stage occasionally today to introduce our speakers and our three sure to be lively panel discussions. First, I've been tasked with reiterating the ground rules around today's program and the related interactions. <clears throat> We're on TV. <laughs> uh, all proceedings are on the record, including all speakers and questions and comments that are recognized by the session moderator. On the other hand, all the informal conversations and comments during the conference, including at receptions, meals, and coffee breaks, are off the record <clears throat> unless otherwise established as such. If you wish for a conversation to be on the record, you should establish the ground rules with the participants. By attending this conference, you consent to be photographed video recorded and audio recorded by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Seems like everybody's staying. So, <laughs> to get things started, I'd like to introduce Lisa Ryu. Lisa is a Senior Associate Director in the Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation, where she oversees the cross-portfolio supervision function that includes the Federal Reserve Supervisory Stress Test Program, risk identification and analysis, shared national credit program, and business technology risk. Lisa chairs the Model Oversight Group and is also a member of the LISIC Operating Committee. Please welcome Lisa to the stage. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'm hoping this picture will go away at some point. <laughs> And I think uh, somebody pointed out I look very relaxed in this picture is because it's, it was taken before I actually started working on the stress testing and first joined the Fed, and that explains the, you know, the, my relaxed mode. Uh, good morning. Um, I am, uh, as Bill uh, just introduced me, I'm Lisa Ryu. Um, I'm speaking uh, today as a co-chair of the conference organizing committee along with Bill Bassett, who introduced me. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this conference. It is aptly titled, Stress Testing, a Discussion and Review. Um, I would, uh, we owe many thanks to President Rosengren uh, and staff at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston for hosting this conference. So before I actually go into the, my prepared remark, which is always dangerous zone, uh, zone when I started to go off the script, but um, I, you know, I was going over my prepared remarks last, uh, last night, just thinking about what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and then kind of, it started to come, my mind started to wonder and started thinking about um, what led me to, to be involved in the stress testing, among many other things I could have been doing. Um, and then I concluded <clears throat> that perhaps new, uh, being a near lifetime fan of New York Mets may have something to do with it. So, so let me explain what, you know, what I'm trying to get to. I know there are several people on the audience who know me is, is wondering where is she going with this statement. And I, I, I thought I told her not to talk about sports and, 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 and all those things. But so let me see, let me see if I can bring it back. Uh, stress testing is obviously a hypothetical exercise. We kind of envision a potential stress scenario, however it's remote, uh, see how the banks uh, remain resilient to their stress. We mess fans, however, know bad things will happen. Regardless of you know, whether you start the season with four great starting pitchers, one of whom happened to be former Cy Young winner or not, something will always go wrong. And we think throughout the season, what else can go wrong? So I'm thinking that being a lifetime Mets fan prepares me well uh, for being a, maybe perhaps, close to lifetime stress tester here at the Federal Reserve. So it has been 10 years since the Federal Reserve and other U.S. banking regulators first used stress testing, as we know it today, uh, to publicly gauge the resilience and health 
of the, uh, the largest and most complex banks in the United States. Uh, much has changed since then, as we are all aware. The banking sector is much better capitalized than it was then. Stress testing has also become a crucial part of the U.S. bank supervision for a large bank and is now an established regulatory vernacular, not only in the U.S., but also globally. So we do have a speaker in the first panel who is representing Bank of England and their stress test, and that is the testament of, of the how stress testing has become an accepted norm in the regulatory community. Here in the US, we have just completed ninth annual stress testing. Um, it's, it's hard to believe it has been nine years, but this has been the ninth year, and, and, and at least would like to think that has been another successful year of the stress testing. Yet, as some of the uh, key architect of that first stress test who, uh, uh, who are attending this conference can attest, some of the discussion topics today echo many of the questions and discussion we had in 2009. So let me just go over some of the questions we are still grappling with, uh, hopefully which will uh, foreshadow some of the discussions to come today. Those discussions include, is the stress testing an effective policy tool for all times, not only during the crisis, but also during peace times. Can and should the stress test be used for counter-cyclical purposes? And if so, in what ways? And if not, what other alternative would they be? What is an appropriate role for banks' internal models? Uh, how transparent and dynamic should the stress testing be? What are the unintended consequences? And how do we mitigate those unintended consequences? And finally, what has been and would be the effect of a stress testing? I think these are the all questions we've been asking. Clearly, these are not easy questions. These are the difficult questions, and which is precisely the reason why the debate endures to today. Your answers will reflect the particular lens through you through which you look at these questions. So for example, the question of the optimal dynamism and transparency, which is a topic for the second panel of today, um, will likely differ depending on whether your primary focus is about the effectiveness of the stress testing uh, for ensuring resilience to all kind of dynamic changes externally, or you are, uh, your primary focus is about more of a certainty of the capital requirements to better facilitate planning forward. Uh, likewise, the appropriate role of banks' internal models in capital regulation would depend on your views on, on the importance of an independent and consistent yardstick and whether or how idiosyncratic risk the banks face should be captured. Over the past few years, the Federal Reserve has incrementally increased the transparency of its stress testing. In past few years, we, ha we held a, a, something called a stress testing model symposium here in Boston. Uh, it provided a forum where the industry representatives and regulators could come together to discuss best practices. Earlier this year, we published the, a little bit more details about our stress test, but not full details. Um, um, and uh, while many responded positively about certain aspect of the disclosure, some, including my former colleagues, thought we went too far and we shouldn't go as far as we did. Um, and others, however, asked for even more um, and a few even requesting the full recipe. Clearly, there is a spectrum of responses. The jury is still out. And hopefully, we will be enlightened by the discussion we'll have uh, during our panels to answer some of those questions. The con this conference is another step forward uh, towards great transparency in public policy making and seeks to benefit from active discussions and discourse on this topic. 
With that in mind, I'm particularly pleased to see such diverse groups attending this conference. So let me just go over eight, eight groups of people who are attending today's conference. There are academics, banking analysts, there are bankers, there are representatives of community development and public interest groups, congressional staffers somewhere here in the audience, regulators both domestic and foreign, and finally, a dozen or so area students. My not so modest hope today is that the student attending today's conference will be so inspired by today's event and discussions that they will consider public service for their future career. One can always hope. Today's three panels consist of speakers with diverse experiences and perspective that should enrich the discussions. Some of the panelists are my former colleagues who had a hand in shaping the stress testing in the US in 2009 and afterwards. Some bring an academic rigor and analytical rigor that honed in academia. And others bring various empirical perspectives from the banking industry, the investment community, and finally, the public. We are particularly indebted to authors and co-authors uh, of the three discussion papers that nicely frame the three broad questions we pose to them. I very much look forward to open and active discussions among the distinguished speakers, but also with the audience, following the footsteps of a long and fruitful tradition in policymaking. Finally, I cannot possibly cl close my remark without giving some shout outs to, to numerous and dedicated colleagues around the Federal Reserve System who have made the stress testing it is today. And finally, to Tam Watkins, who is over there, um, without whom we could not have this conference today. And thank you, and I look forward to discussions. Thank you, Lisa, for kicking off today's program. And I guess you could say that four World Series later, bringing up the Mets in the city is much less of a stress test. <laughs> so. Our next speaker really needs no introduction for this group. Federal Reserve and FOMC Chair Jay Powell has served on the Board of Governors since May 2012 and began his current four-year term as the chair in February 2018. Prior to joining the board, he was a visiting scholar at the Bipartisan Policy Center, a partner at the Carlisle Group, an assistant secretary and undersecretary of the Treasury under President George H.W. Bush. Unfortunately, Chair Powell could not be here today, but he has sent along these taped remarks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to President Rosengren and the Boston Fed for hosting this conference. The Federal Reserve is strongly committed to stress testing as a cornerstone of our bank supervisory and financial stability missions. Stress testing is perhaps the most successful supervisory innovation of the post-crisis era. But if stress tests are to continue to serve their critical function, they will need to evolve in the years ahead to keep pace with the ever-changing financial system, as they have since the first round of stress tests in 2009. Before looking to the future, let me recall a bit of history. A little more than 10 years ago, the United States and the world teetered on the brink of economic catastrophe. What was urgently needed was a way to restore confidence in the financial system, a daunting challenge. Neither the banks, nor the regulators, nor the public had a reliable sense of the strength and resilience of our major banks. The announcement of forward-looking stress testing results in May 2009 helped restore confidence and stabilize banks by providing a credible and independent picture of their finances. These original stress tests evolved into the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, or CCAR, program, which has served to institutionalize capital planning by firms and supervision by the Fed 
as a forward-looking endeavor. Since 2009, large banks have added more than $800 billion in common equity capital, giving them a much thicker cushion to deal with losses. Banks have gotten much better at assessing and managing their risks, effectively tracking commitments across their organizations, anticipating capital needs, and planning for different scenarios. The stress tests of the future, five and ten years from now, will need to continue to ensure that banks remain able, even in a severe downturn, to provide the credit that households and businesses depend on. As financial institutions and the financial system evolve, stress testing will need to keep up. When the next episode of financial instability presents itself, it may do so in a messy and unexpected way. Banks will need to be ready not just for expected risks, but for unexpected ones. Thus, the tests will need to vary from year to year and to explore even quite unlikely scenarios. If the stress tests do not evolve, they risk becoming a compliance exercise, breeding complacency from both supervisors and banks. We might also inadvertently encourage the development of a banking system where, over time, all banks would look much alike, rather than the banking system we want and need, one with diverse institutions with different business models. We simply can't let these things happen. The purpose of today's gathering is to help us think about how to ensure the tests continue to foster a dynamic banking system, financial stability, and a healthy and growing economy. We have invited a wide range of participants, fellow regulators, bankers, analysts, academics, and community groups with diverse perspectives. Because we do not claim a monopoly on knowledge or wisdom, we have invited many who have disagreed with us in the past. I strongly believe that diverse perspectives and healthy debate will sharpen our thinking and lead us to better answers. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you today, and I particularly want to thank all of the speakers, discussants, and other participants for helping us grapple with the challenges of ensuring that tomorrow's stress tests remain as effective and vigorous as they are today. Thank you.
program. Mike is also the author of many articles on value at risk, stress testing, and credit derivatives. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Okay, good morning. Uh, we're having our own audio-visual audio stress test today. Uh, it's a planned part of the program. It's not, uh, not unexpected. Uh, so well, let me add my welcome. I'm Mike Gibson. I'm the Director of Supervision and Regulation at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. Uh, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for the first panel. Uh, really appreciate all the panelists uh, being willing to speak and uh, share their thoughts on stress tests as a policy tool. Uh, let me just go over the uh, background rules for the panel. Uh, first, we're going to have the presentation uh, of the paper by Andrew Metrick. Andrew is a professor at Yale University, and the paper is co-authored with Greg Feldberg, who is the director of research at the Yale Program of Financial Stability. Uh, then we've got three distinguished panelists, and I'll just introduce them now. Uh, the first panelist uh, speaker will be Charlotte Gherkin. She's the director of the cross-sectoral and insurance policy at the Bank of England. Second will be Dennis Kelleher. He's the president and chief executive officer of Better Markets. And our third panelist will be Brian Lee. He's the chief accounting officer and controller at Goldman Sachs. The panel is going to... Uh, the, the paper presentation uh, will lead off, then each of the discussants will make their remarks, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, I'll ask some questions in my role as moderator, and then we'll also have an opportunity to have questions from the audience. So please uh, think about your questions now, uh, because we've built in plenty of time for discussion, and we're really interested in uh, having a, a great exchange of views today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Metrick to make the presentation. It's loaded up here. Oh, there it is. All right, great. All I have to do is click. Oh, uh, it clicked for me. <laughs> I'm seeing it. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Metrick from uh, Yale, and I have this paper with my Yale colleague, Greg Feldberg, who's sitting down there. Uh, the opinions expressed in this paper are not necessarily the opinions of Yale University um, or the Federal Reserve System. That was a joke. I'm just kidding. We don't have to give a disclaimer when we talk. Okay. All right, so what, what I'm going to do today is a little bit of an introduction I mean, it's kind of uh, uh, why we're here, what it is we were trying to do. And then really we have a series of observations and implications of those observations for stress testing, kind of the big picture of stress testing. Um, we are, none of the things that we have today that I'm going to talk about here today are specific policy proposals where we think you should do exactly one thing or another thing, or models. If you look at our paper, you won't find any uh, models in there at all. There is no math whatsoever. Uh, and we did that on purpose. We really were trying to take a 30,000 foot view of stress tests and, and think about where we are and where we've come. So where does that begin? We were asked to think about stress tests as policy. Um, it begins really thinking, this, this, thinking about what the stress test was meant to do when the SCAP uh, was first used in 2009, and it was very much a wartime 
exercise then. We were really quite desperate, and we people were concerned that the banks were completely uh, insolvent, and not just undercapitalized, but insolvent. And if you have insolvent banks and the government's not going to support them, then we're going to run on them. And so they needed, they were either going to need to convince people that they were well capitalized, or they were going to have to go get capital right then. That's the wartime exercise of a stress test. But now we have peacetime stress tests. We've just did our ninth. And the question is, how are we doing? And are there any principles that we can use going forward uh, that would help to inform that? And really, the first thing to recognize is that we really are anchored a bit in the way we think about stress tests still in this time of crisis. So a lot of the conversations that I have with people about stress tests are stressful. So you talk to the people and they're nervous that tomorrow there'll be a run on the banks. Uh, and that is kind of a feeling that, that we still have. Uh, and I think one thing that, that we had to do when we were writing this paper and thinking through these things was to really try to situate ourselves a, a little bit differently. Imagine what if we had invented this, these stress tests purely as a peacetime exercise that didn't have that anchor. Oh, one thing I also just want to mention here that is quite important as an introduction is we intend to say nothing about the average level of capital that is needed at banks. This is much more about the changes over time. So the, the level of capital debate is one where we don't have great cost-benefit models. We're never going to have a perfect answer. It's actually quite frustrating. Um, great minds can disagree on both sides, but that's not actually what the stress tests are about. Sometimes things about the level, the average level of capital over the course of the cycle creep into our debates about stress tests, but that's really, they, they shouldn't. We kind of separate that out. It's much more variations around that average and how they happen over the cycle and across banks that is the, the right topic for, for what, what we should be thinking about when we think about stress tests. Okay, so I have five observations. Greg and I at various times had nine and three and five. We're down to five. Okay, so we have five things that we, we thought when we started that they were going to be pretty non-controversial. And we each had five observations that we were sure were non-controversial that were non-overlapping. Uh, so, so it turns out it's not that easy to figure out things that you do think are, are really non-controversial. But, but now this is, this is as close as we're going to get, at least for us. Okay, so the first is individual banks know more than supervisors do about their bank's idiosyncratic risks, but supervisors know more than banks do about system-wide risks. So the, the point here is to start us along the path of thinking what are the comparative advantages of running stress tests in a certain way and if we can think about those comparative advantages, what, what direction might we want to move in with any individual policy changes? And this observation is just you know, the first part of it I think nobody will argue with, which is that uh, uh, how, whatever we think of the risk management practices at banks at any point in time, they're going to have a better insight into their own idiosyncratic risks than anybody else would outside of their business. The second part of it, sometimes uh, you'll get people saying that they, they understand the get banks saying that they understand the whole uh, um, landscape better than the supervisors do, but I don't think that's true. Uh, the supervisors are seeing data from all over the place, and uh, they're really able and have a comparative advantage at knowing, for example, if there are a whole lot of concentrated risks in the system at any point in time. So that's our first observation. Second observation is uh, in bank supervision, transparency is a double-edged sword. And here, actually, I'm not just talking about transparency of the models, which is going to get a lot of attention today. I, I, I think the transparency of the inputs that goes in, but also the transparency of the outputs, uh, what we say about the banks and how well they did on the stress tests publicly. Overall, transparency is kind of like you know, apple pie and baseball, not the Mets, but other baseball. Um, you can't have, this is like a great thing. It's an all-American thing. We want to be transparent. How could you be against transparency in any particular way? That's a very um, securities market way of looking at things. 
In, in the world of banking, actually, uh, my colleague Gary Gorton has a, has a whole research line about banks as secret keepers, that basically saying that banks can do what they do because they are, in, in many ways, opaque. That, in fact, opacity is a feature, not a bug, of the way we design and create and manufacture safe assets. Um, so, and, and there's, there's a lot of research that, that really supports the idea that actually uh, transparency when it comes to the safe debt side of the world is a very, very different animal than transparency on the securities market side. So in terms of outputs, one thing here is just to recognize, starting with a tendency and not with a, uh, a, a specific policy proposal, but a tendency to say that it's just having more transparency is really not, not necessarily a good thing on that side. On the input side, you know, it's an, it's a, it's an obvious kind of statement. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Quarles has said, you know, he understands. You don't give out the answers to the test before the test or the questions. <laughs> uh, so people understand that. Um, but I, I think also some of the debate about transparency, and I'll get to this in a, in a few minutes, is really a debate about something else, that the transparency ends up being a substitute for complaints really about what the effects of the test are. So I, I'm probably used like half my time already. How long am I supposed to go for? I have 10 more minutes? All right, so I, I better speed up, because I got a couple more of these things. I, I only have one more slide after this. I am well prepared. Okay, so, so next, even with perfect models accepted by everyone, banks and their regulators will rationally disagree on the optimal speed of adjustment after a stress test. So I think a lot of times when we end up fighting about the models, and the models being good, and the models being bad, it's really just a fight about what are, the, what are these models going to get used for and how fast am I going to have to, if I am a bank, raise capital. And it's important to note and to have always in the background of the, argue, of, of the discussion, as any mediator would do, a recognition that it is costly to have to change capital plans and capital levels quickly. That's a costly thing. Even people who say that it's not costly to hold capital, to have more capital, in a bank, uh, uh, I think, would agree that changing it quickly is costly. There's a long corporate finance literature on that. Um, so banks won't want to do that. That's privately costly to them. On the other hand, the banks are never going to internalize the externalities of their failure on all the other banks. And so to the extent that raising your capital levels quickly will lower your probability of failure, uh, the, the regulators are going to want that to happen faster. That's always going to be the case. So that even if we could agree, here are exactly the right models and here are exactly the right scenarios, we're going to have this tension. And we sometimes, I'm almost certain, when we're arguing about models, we're really arguing about how fast do I have to change after those models. So the fourth observation is, in peacetime, regular stress testing is critical to keep risk managers and supervisors' eyes on the ball. So what is it not? This is, a, this is a, okay, yeah, we want to keep our eyes on the ball. What is it not? It's not necessarily in peacetime about very, very quickly going and raising capital. So when I think about what would be very, very useful in a stress test in historical crisis episodes, if we had them a couple years before the crisis, it would be to be very informative about risk and about things that we were missing. In a panic, or in an incipient panic, you sometimes need to capitalize things very fast. And moving very fast will be necessary to restore the confidence that enables you to function. Outside of a panic, uh, I can't think of examples like that, where I would say, oh, god, if we had just very, very quickly gone and done that, often that action by itself is enough to destabilize things. That actually, the speed is not necessarily such a wonderful thing in, in peacetime. Okay, and then fifth, migration of financial activity away from banks without appropriate oversight of the non-bank financial sector will weaken financial stability. So say, what does that have to do with stress tests? Um, migration must be mentioned any time you mention anything about bank capital. Uh, it is a, a really a, a, it's the reason we had the last crisis was we had a tremendous amount of migration. It wasn't just the banks. And going forward, whenever we think about what particular policies we're going to do for banks, 
we need to be thinking about what, those will what effects those will have on migration. And that needs to be part of the planning process. So stress tests can be particularly good at this. If they do their job well, they will be able to see what is going on in the non-bank part of the world uh, faster than we would in the absence of having stress tests. It could be a very important tool. OK, I think I have about five minutes or so, and so I have three implications. So I'll, I'll or three or four, four implications. I'll do them fast. The first, and, and these are very, th this maps almost exactly, Lisa, to the questions that you asked earlier. I was very pleased. So you gave your questions, maybe because we knew them before. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the first is macro prudential versus micro prudential. So again, focusing on comparative advantages here, what is it that the stress tests can do since the, since the supervisors are really able to look across and always going to have a comparative advantage at looking across, there's a huge value to using the stress test as much as possible for macro prudential things. So the countercyclical buffer is a good example. What they do in England uh, with, with using the stress test to help inform countercyclical policy strikes us as being a great use of the comparative advantage of stress tests. Second, on speed of adjustment, I've already talked about this a lot. I do think that a tendency here is that we're very focused on the level of capital that's necessary. We might want to have higher average level capital at banks. I do think that it is worth thinking about uh, whether or not if we were to make the speed of adjustment to the newly required capital levels higher or lower uh, after a stress test slower if it weren't an immediate thing, that actually a lot of the arguments and uh, uh, debates and anger about the models and how secret the models have to be would go away. And that actually we could make the stress tests, we didn't use this word in the paper, but I wanted to use it, nastier. Even worse scenarios, even tougher, even, uh, e even tougher scenarios, even uh, wilder ideas. Um, we could learn a lot more from them, and we, could, and we would be able to do that without the costs that are currently seen as the, most, the worst costs by industry. On transparency, I think uh, Greg and I uh, make almost everybody unhappy. I th there should, we're going to let Mark, who has a whole paper on it, uh, uh, do most of the work, but for our short 30 seconds to say that overall here, the tendency, I think, should go in the direction of less transparency across the board. Less transparency of the models, less transparency of all of the inputs, less transparency of the outputs. Finally, coming back to this theme of peacetime and wartime, part of the, the reason that perhaps some of the things that when we said them to our friends, when I say them to other people who work on stress tests, they look at me funny, uh, is because we do continue to think about the stress test as a wartime animal. And that actually in wartime, you want to do stuff differently. And we would need to then think about what is, as many have asked us, the transition between peacetime and wartime. Uh, bold ideas like having some kind of DEF CON clock like they have at the Defense Department turn out not to work all that well, since it probably wouldn't be useful for maintaining the calm in the economy for the Federal Reserve to say we are now at DEF CON 2 uh, in the banking system. It, it seems that we actually have a reasonably good balance right now. And the balance that we have right now is a variety of systemic risk type exceptions that exist in a variety of places in our regulatory system that effectively act as the wartime triggers when we can do things that we weren't able to do in peacetime. And that this balance seems to be a pretty good one. And that outside of that, we should be thinking about what it is it that the stress tests or any uh, regulatory, any kind of regulatory measure can bring us in peacetime to help us prevent the next crisis uh, and learn the huge amount of information gaps that we have that are usually the things that precede these crises. That's it, almost on time. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. That was, that was great. I think you've definitely raised uh, many, probably not all, but many of the issues that we'll be talking about today.
the first discussant uh, is Charlotte Gherkin. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much to the Federal Reserve uh, for inviting me to this conference. Um, at the Bank of England, uh, we're currently reviewing our approach to stress testing, and we'll publish a, re uh, a revised uh, approach document later this year. Uh, so while any time is a good time to uh, talk about stress testing, now is a particularly good time, um, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot today and ideas uh, about advancing both our approach as you're advancing yours. Um, Greg and Andrew's paper has given us much to think about, and I've had to narrow down uh, the number of topics I can kind of give reflections on now. And I'll offer a few thoughts on the why, what, and how aspects of stress testing and policy. I'll comment on the macro um, versus micro prudential policy objectives, the use of stress testing for quantitative capital requirements and more qualitative uh, improvements, in business understanding, uh, planning, and risk management. And also pick up on some of the points in the paper about model risk, um, both for banks performing stress tests and for policymakers. Well, around the why, um, the paper reminds us why bank stress testing became such a useful tool for policymakers during the crisis. And it does remain a powerful tool to ensure that in a financial macroeconomic shock, banks can absorb shocks rather than amplify them. The paper discusses the macro and micro policy objectives in connection with this aim. The macro prudential objective in the paper that banks can continue to lend to the real economy in stress times certainly guides our approach in the UK. The concurrent stress tests uh, we perform under the annual cyclical scenario on the larger seven UK banking groups have an explicit link to macro prudential policy through the counter-cyclical buffer that Andrew mentioned. The aim is to adjust systematically the severity of the scenario in relation to the Financial Policy Committee's risk assessment, informed by risk indicators, and thereby make the changes in the scenario severity of the stress test fairly predictable to reduce the vo volatility around requirements which Greg and Andrew highlight as a design issue and Vice Chair Qualls referred to in his speech last October. The Bank of England stress tests include a severe global shock as well as the UK shock that directly affects the counter-cyclical buffer so that we can gain sufficient coverage for the various different business models of the banks in the test. To meet micro prudential objectives, the Prudential Regulation Committee is also informed by other firm-specific analysis, including the firm's own individual capital assessment, in order to decide whether to take micro-prudential action through a firm-specific PRA buffer. As far as what stress tests are trying to achieve, our stress tests have helped both banks' management and regulators bring confidence to their financial resilience, measured through risk-weighted and leverage ratios. But over time, as we've learned and developed our approach, the stress tests have enabled banks and ourselves to identify and understand vulnerabilities, both from a macro and micro perspective, and enabled stress testing to become more of a preemptive policy tool, which enables action to be taken before a stress, uh, rather than being used to make running repairs during one. In relation to observation one in the paper, I think there is a feedback loop between a firm's understanding of its idiosyncratic risks and the input provided by supervisors. By way of an example, uh, in 2017, our policy committees wanted a more rigorous assessment of consumer credit in the annual cyclical scenario. The PRA had found that lenders were reducing interest margins and risk weights associated with consumer credit while beginning to increase lending to high-risk market segments. We wanted to explore whether the fall in defaults over the preceding five years reflected factors that should be discounted when assessing how loans would perform under stress. Whether banks were attributing too much of the improvement to underlying improvement in credit quality and too little to a macroeconomic environment of sustained employment growth and low interest rates, as well as the growth of interest-free uh, credit card offers. While the results certainly had implications in terms of capital requirements, the more, the more enduring outcome 
we were aiming for uh, was a shift in banks' assessment of the risks they're running. Noting the balance of stress testing between quantitative capital requirements and broader vulnerability assessment and risk management, one type of stress test can achieve only so much. We introduced another uh, concurrent stress test uh, that speaks more to the objective of improving banks and our understanding of vulnerabilities and strengthening risk management. We ran what we call the biennial exploratory scenario for the first time in 2017. Being exploratory in nature, um, each, each one is designed differently according to the risks being explored. In 2017, it was designed to have a longer scenario than the five years we use for the annual cyclical stress test. It looked at, the scenario, at a scenario with some long-term trends that could affect banks' sustainability and ability to generate capital organically. The trends in the scenario included long-term low interest rates and the implications of competition, particularly from uh, fintech, for firms' cost-income ratios. Uh, but perhaps the fintech aspect didn't need a long-term scenario uh, after all. Uh, we learned quite a bit ourselves about running this different sort of stress test um, and about the relationship between banks' business functions, uh, here the strategy function, as well as frontline business units, uh, finance and risk, the latter obviously being more involved uh, in the uh, annual cyclical scenario test. We've already uh, flagged our intent for 2021's exploratory scenario to conduct a climate stress test for financial institutions to help bring into the mainstream climate uh, risk management. I said I would touch on model risk, uh, which Greg and Andrew discuss in the context of transparency uh, and the risk of banks focusing their efforts on gaming the Fed's models. I agree with their assessment that a model monoculture uh, could lead everyone to missing a tail risk, as they observed happened in the run-up to the financial crisis. And model risk management uh, was an area we focused on in our qualitative review in 2018. We noted that all the banks participating in the stress test demonstrated an increased awareness uh, of the need to implement effective model risk management. Uh, and some banks had made good progress uh, against the PRA's uh, expectations. Um, but other banks needed to make substantial improvement to raise the management of model risk to a standard required for stress testing and the majority of the banks uh, needed to increase their board and senior management understanding of limitations in their key stress testing models. Where material adjustments uh, are applied, banks management needed to consider whether the judgments were well supported. With the relevant accounting standard changing last year for us to IFRS 9, which also relies heavily on models, uh, decision making by firms, let alone policy makers, is even more exposed to model risk, whether from input data, assumptions, or methodologies. At the Bank of England, uh, we're trying to do as we, uh, do as we say, uh, or do as we tell others to do in developing our own models for stress testing. Uh, one area we're working on is modeling systemic risk amplification aspects. For example, though there are major challenges uh, in the availability and robustness of data as well as how we currently scope our stress testing framework, uh, which restricts uh, how uh, banks respond to the stress. For example, they need to maintain a lending market share during the stress period. We're at a very early stage in using our models for policy. And rather than presenting a single specific scenario, we take a range of plausible scenarios and outcomes using what ifs to communicate potential systemic risks to the committees. In increasing the effectiveness of our stress tests for policy, uh, we've been looking at three themes to take forward. Uh, one is taking a more holistic approach to scenario design, leveraging supervisory expertise more, uh, and conducting sensitivity analysis, exploring variants of the scenario. Uh, second, uh, we're reviewing our data requirements and updating our modeling strategy. And third, uh, we're working on our external disclosure strategy, both to guide policymakers' decisions and to provide enhanced feedback uh, to the banks. Uh, but with the expectation of uh, the productive discussions today, I, uh, I fear and expect, uh, or perhaps hope, that uh, the number of themes could well get longer. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, the next speaker is Dennis Kelleher.
Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Chairman Powell and Vice Chairman Quarles uh, for holding the conference and for inviting me to participate, and importantly, for understanding and acting on the need not only for transparency with the public, but for going outside the usual suspects and including alternate views and even dissenting voices. Uh, as Chairman Powell recently said, disagreement is not only healthy, but important. Um, before uh, uh, turning to the paper, for those of you who have asked, and many of you have, uh, who's Better Markets? Better Markets was founded uh, just after the Dodd-Frank Law in 2010. It's a nonprofit, independent, D.C.-based organization that promotes the public interest throughout the economic and financial policymaking process in Washington. We've participated in more than 200 rulemakings. Many of the related lawsuits testified in Congress numerous times and issued lots of reports. Um, we have uh, lots of information on our website if you really want to know more. Uh, Turning to the topic of the panel, I'm going to offer some quick observations on policy related to the issues raised by Andrew and Greg and their thoughtful and thought-provoking paper that I encourage you to read. Uh, because there's too much to say in too little time, if you want to know more about Better Markets' views on the details of stress tests and the Fed-specific proposals, again, they're on our website at www.bettermarkets.com. You'll find lots of information and where I also hope to be posting more detailed thoughts on the paper in the conference in the coming days. My first observation relates to what is at stake. The only thing standing between a failing bank and a taxpayer bailout and an economic and human catastrophe is loss-absorbing capital, period, full stop. That is really what we're talking about when we're talking about stress tests. The last crash is going to cost the United States more than $20 trillion in lost GDP, which Better Markets did a study on called the cost of the crisis uh, and the cost of the crash. Those dollars don't reflect the human suffering all across this country as tens of millions of Americans lost their jobs, homes, health care, and so much more. If stress tests fails, fail and banks don't have sufficient loss-absorbing capital, then the public is again going to suffer the consequences and get the bill for that failure and they should have a seat at the table, and their interest should be the center of any discussion, which I will return to at the end of my remarks. A second observation would be don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. U.S. stress tests are the gold standard. Stress tests have worked exceptionally well. You don't need to be told that they have been used at one of the most perilous times in our country since the Great Depression of the 1930s. That real-time live stress test of stress tests restored the confidence of the financial system and the public. And then remember, the opposite happened in Europe. They too at that time employed stress tests. Virtually all the banks passed, but the tests weren't considered rigorous, lacked transparency, and left substantial capital holes. And thus, Europe's stress tests lacked credibility. That's the risk here, losing credibility. And that leads to my third observation. I'd suggest that stress tests be thought of primarily as credibility tests for the Fed. That credibility has already taken some hits. Some are already referring to them as well on the way to being no stress stress tests. Others have observed that stress tests have gone from confidence builders to mere capital ejection mechanisms. Some have noted that what was originally thought of as a process to create a capital floor has created a capital ceiling. We should ask if a test where 100% of the test takers pass every time with flying colors is a valid, credible test. Such results are usually a red flag. We need to ask if it is wise that a bank failing the stress test should be avoided at all costs. Entire new words and processes are being developed and deployed to avoid even saying the word fail. When Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley failed the test by falling under capital, the capital requirements last year, the Fed didn't fail them. Rather, it invented a euphemism, quote, conditional non-objection, close quote. We need to think about how these actions, changes, and mindsets are fundamentally challenging the credibility of the tests and, yes, the credibility of the Fed. I'll turn to my paper with my fourth observation. As you've heard, Andrew and Greg have suggested an analytic framework organized around the concepts of peacetime and wartime regulation. While theoretically interesting, the likelihood of correctly knowing when it is peacetime is impossible, and being wrong, even by a little bit, will be dangerous, if not catastrophic. We don't have to speculate about that. We have definitive proof. Let's take a minute to speak honestly and openly about the years before the 2008 crash. 
We had failures of judgment of historic proportion by policymakers, elected officials, and by regulators, including prominently the Federal Reserve Board, its staff, and its many affiliates like the New York Fed. They were mostly wrong, dead wrong, with grave consequences. A tragic groupthink blinded most to growing risks and the coming catastrophe. We're not talking about ancient history like the 1990s. Think back to the celebration of the Greenspan years at the 2005 Jackson Hole Conference. Even the mildest indirect academic dissent was not just greeted with disagreement, but disdain, ridicule, and name calling. Peacetime reigned. No need to even question the prevailing, dare I say, wisdom. It was peacetime. Everybody agrees. Markets know best. The least regulation was best. The biggest financial institutions in the world could self-regulate and self-police. None of them would ever make outside, take outside risk that might endanger the viability of their firms or reputations for brilliant sophistication and risk management. Now, none of that is to cast dispersions. Those are just the facts. They are facts that no one saw coming, even the brightest of the bright. The unavoidable conclusion is that we all must be deeply humble about our ability to determine when a crisis is coming, or frankly, even when we're in the middle of one. That means that artificial constructs of peacetime and wartime and the false comfort the former instills should be rejected as unworkable and should not be a guide for policy and certainly not policy deregulation because it's supposedly peacetime. For example, in the years before the 2008 crash, exactly when did we move from peacetime to wartime? When subprime loans or synthetic CDOs reached a certain level? When the Bear Stearns hedge funds collapsed in 2007? When they shot their books earlier in 2007? When Goldman flipped to the big short? When Northern Rock failed? To ask these questions is to reveal that they aren't answerable even in hindsight, and certainly not in the middle of peacetime going to wartime, maybe wartime. Um, however, I would suggest that when it comes to financial regulation, you are always at war. Which is my next observation. Policymakers in general, and regulators in particular, should accept that conflict in financial regulation is inevitable, healthy, and indeed a sign of success. The paper says that stress test exercise, quote, remains a more or less contentious process, close quote, which the authors attribute to, quote, bankers bristling at the perceived loss of control over basic capital planning decisions, close quote. And they note that it is important that there will always be conflict here, quote, but, I'm sorry, but largely limit that to, quote, the speed of capital adjustment after a stress test, close quote. That limitation is too limited. Regulators and bankers are always and inevitably at war, even if they don't always feel it. That's because it's not a hot war, but a steady state cold war. You have financial institutions pressing the limits at all times as they profit, if not bonus maximize. We have to stop pretending that we agree on the financial reform goals and mostly on the ways to achieve them. Ending too big to fail and workable resolution plans are prime examples. Effective stress tests and sufficient loss absorbing capital are others. Regula regulators and bankers bring and should bring different perspectives to these issues which lead to different views and inevitably disagreement. And that's why the authors noted that the, quote, banks have said thank you, close quote, for greater transparency provided by the Fed, but the banks have nonetheless, quote, asked for even more, close quote. Of course they did. That's their job. It is in direct, but it is in direct conflict with the job of the regulators. That will, that will inevitably result in tension and disagreement, and frankly, that's a good sign. I want to make a related observation. It is most important to understand that evil, evil actors in or evil motives by the private sector are not required for any of these observations or concerns. It is the nature of markets and financial firms individually and ultimately collectively. It is the siren songs of profit maximization and competitive pressures. As Upton Sinclair said so well, quote, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it, close quote. That's why banking regulators and supervisors, as well as oversight regulation and enforcement generally, are so critically important will always have conflict. A concluding observation. The concluding section of the paper entitled, quote, balancing the cost and benefits for banks and regulators, close quote, raises some very serious concerns. 
It begins with a troubling question that frames the discussion of the entire section. Quote, have we struck the right balance between the needs of banks and their regulators, parenthetically, and taxpayers in the stress test policy? Close quote. Taxpayers are only mentioned in the parenthetical, never to appear again. Bankers' needs and wants, in contrast, are very prominent, to the point that the conclusion is, quote, a bank's board should have more power over capital planning in peacetime while regulators should be able to intervene as war approaches, close quote. In addition to rejecting the peacetime wartime framework, I would suggest that focusing on balancing the so-called needs of banks and regulators turns the world upside down. Taxpayers and their needs should be the center of the question, analysis, and answer. I would propose asking the question, do stress tests serve their purpose in protecting the public, taxpayers, the financial system, and our economy from undercapitalized, over-leveraged, too-big-to-fail banks that pocket profits and bonuses in peacetime and shift losses to taxpayers in Main Street in wartime? And let's look at the evidence. Banks had to be bailed out in 2008 by taxpayers because they didn't have the capital to absorb their own losses. Why was that? because those banks spent down their capital on stock buybacks and dividends in the years before the 2008 crash. And indeed, think about this, up to and after the collapse of Lehman on September 15th. That's right, after the collapse of Lehman on September 15th, they were still ejecting capital. The banks intentionally and needlessly reduced their capital cushions even as the crisis was upon them, even as they were taking big losses starting in 2007 even as Bear Stearns collapsed, even as Lehman crashed. The regulators said nothing and did nothing. All the clearly ominous events and warning signs of 2007 didn't slow the capital ejections. In closing, as I said I would at the start, taxpayers must be central to the entire discussion and above the, quote, needs of banks, close quotes. And I reiterate the question that should frame policymaking. Do stress tests serve their purpose in protecting the public, taxpayers, the financial system, and our economy from under, undercapitalized, over-leveraged, too-big-to-fail banks that pocket profits and bonuses and at all times and shift losses to taxpayers in Main Street in a crisis? That is what is at stake in stress tests and loss of absorbing capital. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Our third panelist is Brian Lee. Good morning. So I've already learned something this morning, as I've often wondered as to how my life has become consumed by stress testing. And Lisa gave me the answer, except I have the double whammy of being a Mets and Jets fan. So uh, it's quite the burden that I have also punished my children with, uh, but they'll have to carry that one. Um, so thank you, Mike. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm honored to be amongst the panelists today. Uh, I'll also say I'm speaking on behalf of myself based off of my experience uh, running the CCAR process and managing capital at a large financial institution. I really enjoyed Greg and Andrew's paper, uh, which is balanced and well-researched and addresses some subjects that I have been focused on for some time. Today I'll focus my remarks on three main points. First, Stress testing should indeed involve in peacetime. Second, bank models can be powerful microprudential tools. Third, coherence is critical when stress testing, uh, within stress testing in the broader capital framework. I'll be quick on my first point. I wholeheartedly agree with Greg and Andrew that stress testing is one of the most powerful policy and risk management tools we have, but with common equity for large US banks more than doubling since the crisis, and with significant advances in sophistication of stress testing practices, uh, it is time to, re to recalibrate the stress tests in peacetime. I think that goes for both how the process is conducted and the assumptions within the stress test, which I'll address in my next two points. My views are also reflected uh, by my belief that US stress testing has evolved from a capital raising to a capital allocation tool. Even if that wasn't the intention, the market implications are real and should be taken into account in adjusting design and calibration. On my second point, 
that bank models can be used as micro-prudential tools. I also completely agree with Greg and Andrew that the role of bank-run stress tests in determining their own capital needs could be enhanced. It just, uh, I'll add a few thoughts from my own practical ex uh, experience. To start, by framing why this matters, there was a thought-provoking risk.net article recently about how capital rules have overwhelmed bank strategy. The gist was that regulatory capital requirements are having a significant influence on strategic decision-making. We certainly feel this. We measure the returns of our business based on their regulatory capital usage, amongst other things. If a business isn't covering its cost of capital, we have to ask ourselves whether to continue allocating as much capital to it. It would be helpful if regulatory capital, including stress capital, were aligned with how we view our risks. And if not, we'd at least like to understand the difference between our and the regulatory view. But due to limited transparency, we can't do that today. To me, a better alternative would be for bank models to be used as micro-prudential tools and supervisory models used as macro-prudential tools. I agree that banks have greater understanding of how to model their idiosyncratic risks than supervisors might. And I agree that if bank models were used to inform micro-prudential bank capital requirements, I would feel less urgent about Fed model transparency. But also at the heart of the assertion is that I think the scenarios are the secret sauce of stress testing while the models are just the calculator. If the Fed is concerned about countercyclicality or banks' ability to weather an unexpected change in interest rates or a shock to a particular asset class, they can design a scenario to test this. Scenario design is the primary tool to dynamically and on a forward-looking basis test the strength of each bank and the banking system as a whole. The models used to calculate stress losses, on the other hand, are just the formulas that estimate what will happen to a bank's exposures given the stress scenario. So I could envision a world in which microprudential capital requirements are determined based on the results of supervisory scenarios as calculated using bank models. I agree we would need a process to manage the volatility of scenarios used for this, pur for this purpose. And yes, this would mean different models are used to set each bank's capital requirements, but to me, this is a solution to the model monoculture concern that we have. The models would have to be subject to continued rigorous supervision, including a collaborative dialogue about any differences from Fed results. And as suggested, the Fed could continue to use their models as a macroprudential tool to monitor system-wide linkages, concentrations, and other risks. I don't think decreased reliance on supervisory models would diminish the Federal Reserve's ability to influence the behavior of supervised banks. Use of bank models would simply result in a stronger connection between strategic capital allocation decisions and risks. And I wouldn't be making this recommendation if not for the tremendous efforts of the Federal Reserve post-crisis to raise the modeling and validation standards throughout the industry. Now I'll switch gears to my third point on coherence, uh, on which I'll spend a little bit more time given this wasn't a focus of Greg and Andrew's paper. To reiterate, regulatory capital requirements, including stress testing, are influencing bank capital allocation decisions. As long as that is the case, coherence is critical. In the context of today's panel, today's panel, I'm thinking of coherence on two levels. First, the components of the stress test should be consistent, coherent with each other. Second, the components of the regulatory framework should add up to an aggregate capital requirement per business that is commensurate with the risk of the activity. Digging into the question of coherence within the components of the stress test, I don't think many would disagree that the CCAR global market shock, large counterparty default, and the nine-quarter macroeconomic scenario are often intentionally inconsistent with each other. The macro scenario is actually in the realm of what we might expect in a severe recession, with double-digit unemployment rates, 50% declines in equity prices, and severe declines in real estate and international markets. By contrast, the global market shock, which simulates a severe industry-wide fire sale, is calibrated at a completely different level of severity to the macroeconomic scenario. SIFMA and BlackRock have attempted to quantify the severity of the global market shock. Taking the corporate bond market as an example, they estimate that the shock applied to a single A rated corporate bond has a probability of one in 100,000. That's severe. But when it's other low probability market shocks that are assumed to occur instantaneously across all asset classes in all regions, that the global market shock becomes unrecognizable relative to anything we've seen historically. Estimates may vary. But it should be obvious that there's a large discrepancy between the far tail of the tail calibration of the global market shock and other components of the CCAR exercise. 
As for my second point about capital requirements being commensurate with the level of risk, I fear that we're not thinking about aggregate capitalization rates at the business level when capital requirements are designed. And the cumulative calibration across the stress test and the broader capital framework is leading to systemic risk increasing market changes, some of which Greg and Andrew have highlighted. Continuing with the example of the corporate bond market, it's clear that capital requirements and other requirements have driven intermediation activities from regulated banks to the shadow banking sector. Although some of this may, migration may be intended, research is suggesting that shallow market depth is likely resulting in increased borrowing costs for small corporate issuers and increased transaction costs for asset managers. My bigger concern is that we don't know what will happen in stress, but it's hard to believe that reduced liquidity and greater fragmentation are helpful. This is particularly concerning considering that U.S. companies largely finance operations through U.S. capital markets as opposed to direct lending. I am of the opinion that the stress test would be extremely conservative with recalibrated assumptions based on a thoughtful review of the coherence of the scenario components in the aggregate loss calibration per business. Coherence is also critical when we think about how stress testing fits into the broader capital framework. We are supportive of incorporating stress test results into daily capital requirements through the stress capital framework. Greg and Andrew have highlighted an interesting and important point, though. If FCB, SCB quantifies the capital we need to withstand losses and remain viable, then by adding SCB on top of the GSIP surcharge, we have materially increased the GSIP's post-stress minimum. But that's not how the GSIP surcharge was codified in Basel III. And we have not seen any analysis support why the GSIB surcharge is the right measure for how much more post-stress common equity than 4.5% a GSIB would need to remain viable. These are complex fundamental changes that require due process. I understand that the initial reaction may be that we're better off to err on the side of conservatism when it comes to bank capital requirements. All I know is that when you add up all of the pieces of our capital requirements from the bottoms up, there's double counting of risk to see more reflective of rules being written in silos than deliberate calibration that takes into account all the post-crisis reforms. And that's leading to real market implications in the form of increased cost and potentially increased systemic risks. I don't have time to get into the details, but I'm even more concerned about coherence when I look ahead a couple of years and look at things like the fundamental review of the trading book, Basel III revisions, Cecil, and potentially the countercyclical buffer on the horizon. When each component of the capital framework is being separately modified, Without thinking about the overall coherence of the capital framework, it is unlikely that capitalization rates at the business level will be appropriate. With that, I'll wrap up where I started. Now in peacetime, design choices that were made a decade ago to compensate for lower capital levels and less robust modeling practices are due for revis revisiting. The use of bank models and more coherent assumptions and calibrations to set individual bank capital requirements will improve market outcomes without weakening the stress testing process or safety and soundness. Conversations like the ones we're having today make me hopeful for the future of stress testing, and thank you again for letting me take part in the dialogue. Thanks, Brian. So we've now got half an hour uh, of uh, questions and discussion. And as uh, taking my privilege as moderator, I'm going to ask the first question. So uh, please, members of the audience, be thinking of your questions, because we'll certainly have time for those in a minute. Uh, so one of the themes that I picked up on across, I think, each of the presenters, uh, you talked about the difference between peacetime and wartime or times of stress. Uh, and uh, I want to link that to the point that Andrew and Greg's paper made around the speed of adjustment to the stress test, which I thought was a nice point to make and not one that's often focused on. Uh, and there was definitely a diversity of views across the panelists on this uh, topic, as well as many others, as you heard. So uh, I'm really interested in uh, everyone's reaction or anyone who wants to speak. So my question is, uh, the speed of adjustment, Andrew, your, your comment was that it could be slower in peacetime, and that's a way of, uh, you know, smoothing out some of the bumps around stress testing. Uh, Dennis, you made the point that we don't necessarily know when we're in peacetime and when we're in wartime. Uh, and Charlotte, you made the point that 
one of the values of stress tests is that it's forward looking and it hopefully gives you the capacity to take actions before the stress has really happened. So my question is really about the combination of those. They, the, there's, there needs to be a reconciliation because uh, the, the viewpoints are so different. Can we really be relaxed in peacetime or should we take the view that uh, the stress is just around the corner? So maybe I'll ask Andrew to start first since it's directly coming out of your paper and then offer anyone else who wants to speak the option. Okay, thanks. Anyone else want to well, go I mean, Dennis? I think we have to go back to first principles when we think about this. The premise is that at that point in time, the institution's level of capital is too low. That's first principle. So you're too low in peacetime, assuming you know it's peacetime, and as I won't repeat it, but I think that the uh, the strength of the view of peacetime, wartime, we're moving from one to the other uh, is... Um, dubious at best. Um, and, and, and if you think about, let's assume for a minute we're, we all, we're objectively in peacetime. We know it right now, and in 20 years from now, we look back, we confirms we're in peacetime. Uh, the question I have is, you should be building buffers in peacetime, not thinking about, uh, you know, um, how to make things easier. In fact, counter-cyclical buffers should be put in place now. When, the, when you have, you know, great, Break, record-breaking profits and revenue, and things are going great, and record-breaking bonuses. We should, you, the suggestion is we should be saying, well, they're short on capital now in peacetime. Let's, let's think about how, over a period of time, they can get to where they should be today. And I, and I would say where they should be today is where they should be. They shouldn't have got themselves deficient today. They know better. They, and if they don't know better, then you have qualitative issues, not quantitative issues. So I think that too many uh, issues are getting elided by the discussion of speed, 
or saying it relates to the level. It's not. You have to go back to first principles. And they should be there now. They're not. Let's get them there fast. So to put my perspective on it, and again, I think some of this does come back to the level, but if, if we were taking a perspective that we are at approximately the right level, and that'll be, I'm sure, another part of the whole Q&A. Um, but I, I think the important thing here is really a question which gets back to my secret sauce comment. It's all about the scenario design. And the volatility, if it's actually, if, if we believe we're in the aggregate at roughly the right level, and we're seeing volatility coming from scenario design, then that in particular should be weighed in the cost benefit with regard to the speed that we're making those adjustments. Um, we can look at numerous different scenarios that will give us different answers. That doesn't mean any one of those scenarios is the absolute you know, perfect answer. We know we're never going to forecast whenever the next crisis will be that we have forecasted the perfect scenario. Uh, but the important thing is understanding that it needs to be a severe scenario and how we're thinking about capitalizing the overall system, which I think we certainly have, have achieved, uh, which also led to some of my comments not about changing any of the overall process, but much more just about recalibrating and rethinking after a, a decade. And then on counter-cyclical, the only other thing I would highlight is, you know, we certainly see and feel through scenario design again, uh, the counter-cyclical nature of, of how the scenario has been designed. Um, and if you even look at this last year's um, scenario, uh, I could certainly argue that it's been the second most severe, certainly continuing to take in uh, a counter-cyclical approach. Yeah, building on uh, Brian, your point, uh, that's, I thought it was thinking about the speed of adjustment in sort of two ways. There's the, the speed with which we as regulators need to adjust the severity of the scenario. And in looking at um, our counter-cyclical buffer, as we've done research on how you know, rapidly would we have, or should we have changed a counter-cyclical buffer before the crisis, given what the indicators, the risk indicators were telling us before. Um, but we try to uh, reduce the volatility of the re requirements, so the speed of ad adjustment for firms, um, by giving them 12 months obviously, to move to an increased counter-cyclical buffer, but we can re obviously reduce it um, immediately. Uh, the other way I was thinking about the speed of adjustment was if a, um, if a firm uh, you know, doesn't uh, pass the stress test, um, then what actions it needs to take. Um, for us, with a, that's a longer scenario, we can afford to look at where in that, uh, in that stress period is the low point of the stress. And so whether the management actions will address the deficit in time uh, or whether a firm would actually have to act sooner, and we comment on the, the, bank's, the, the bank's own capital plans as to whether they will be sufficient, or whether actually something speedier would need to be done. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me look to the audience, and please just raise your hand uh, if you want to ask the panelists a question. Over there, Sean. Yeah, they're bringing one. So thanks, my name is Sean Campbell, and I just want to thank the panelists. I really enjoyed the, the discussion. I think I learned a lot this morning, as, I, as I'm sure everybody else did. I guess I just want to return to something that was sort of stated quickly in the observations that I'd like to get. Maybe I'll, I'll provide a comment and then ask for the reactions of the panelists, starting with Professor Metrics, since it was his observation. I think one of the observations that was listed on the slide as sort of a dichotomy uh, I'd like to push back against on, and I'd like to sort of get some reaction from the panelists, which is this notion that sort of you know, banks understand their risks better than the regulator, but the regulator has a better assessment of system-wide risk than the banks. At least that's how I read it, and I'm sure it's more nuanced in the paper, but that's sort of the bullet point version. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to push back strongly against the second part of that bullet point. So I would surely submit, and it's surely the case, that the Fed and regulators have information about exposures across the banking system that no one bank has. That's, that, that's clearly the case, and I would, I, would, I would grant that at the outset. But that simply does not imply, all by itself, that the regulator has a better handle on system-wide risks than other entities in the economy, in particular large banks. So if you ask yourself the question, what is a large bank and what does it do? It is in the risk assessment business across a variety of sectors of the economy. And when you think about what drives the stress tests, what determines whether a bank is going to have a good or a bad year in the stress test is what's happening to the corporate default experience, what's happening to consumer loans, what's happening to auto loans, what's happening to mortgages. 
if you think about those system-wide risks and who's in a position to understand what's on the horizon with respect to those risks, I think it's the banking sector. And as you pointed out in the context of your discussion, what's really important is the increasing size of the shadow banking sector. And when you think about large banks and their commercial interactions with the shadow banking sector, I also think they have a relatively strong handle on what's going on in that part of the sector. And I'm a little bit worried about conferring this immediate advantage to the regulator, and in particular the Federal Reserve is having some all-powerful knowledge about what's going on in the rest of the system that banks don't have. And like, A, I'd like your reaction to my, to my reaction to your bullet point, and I'd like your perspective on how you think information outside of the Federal Reserve, maybe information sitting inside the banking sector should be used in the process of risk assessment and scenario design. provide just a, an, another comment. I guess from my perspective, it also just provides an opportunity to think a little bit more uh, about, again, how to leverage scenario design and maybe going to some of Charlotte's comments about how the Bank of England does it. Um, and one of my fears, getting back to scenario volatility, is we're almost experimenting with a sort of a loaded gun on an annual basis versus using the macro prudential sort of focus um, to be able to run more scenarios, look for concentrations, look for other kinds of systemic issues through running unique and separate scenarios, but not necessarily making them the annual exercise. Uh, and so I think that's where there could be a lot more value added to be more thoughtful um, and to make sure that we don't become stale over time. And just uh, only a very quick comment, which is um, you began by saying the observations that banks understand their risk better than regulators, and of course regulators understand the systemic or, or industry-wide risk better. Um, and you disagreed with the second part, I disagree with the first. Um, the, I mean, you know, everybody here, is, you know, I, I believe is, you know, older than 15 years old. Um, to, to, to start with the premise that banks understand their risks uh, should, should engender healthy, healthy skepticism. You think about 2004, 5, 6, 7, even 8, 9, 10. Um, the, there is, we should all be, as I said before, incredibly humble about drawing conclusions about what we know and the confidence with which we know it or we attribute to others. There's no question they have massive amounts of data, massive amounts of talent. They're in the middle of the flow of how many markets, so they're seeing both their individual firm issues and they're seeing systemic issues, and they're uniquely positioned with unique knowledge in many ways. And we should not jump from there to the conclusion that they understand the risks. 
Um, Dennis, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to refer back to your remarks about incentives and whether uh, banks management are incentivized to perhaps have a look, at, look to the, the downside. Um, and I think there, is the, there could be agreement about what, what is happening in the, in the economy or the markets, but I think the, uh, the range of uncertainty of expectations about what might happen um, a regulator will be perhaps moving to uh, a perhaps a more pessimistic view than a firm's, uh, than a firm's management uh, might. I gave an example in my comments of where we had um, re-identified where we thought your firm's models were working well in good times, but were they really um, set up to think about um, a downside stress and where actually then the questions we were asking, and I think that's really the important thing about the, the stress testing is that asking those questions as to what have, have we kind of really thought about how a portfolio may perform in conditions other than those in which a model is working perfectly fine. Mike, maybe just a follow-up, almost taking the question to another level and following up a little bit on, on risk management. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things, and I think it ties into this conference and the overall you know, efforts over the years um, is the investments that have been made by the regulators as well as by firms, uh, particularly from a stress testing perspective. Uh, some of the conversations we're having today, I don't know if I would have taken a strong stance five years ago. There has been a huge investment that doesn't by any means mean that regulators or individual firms have perfect vision. Um, but I think it is important to recognize the, you know, the great effort that has gone into putting us to a much better place than we certainly were pre-COVID. Okay, thanks. Uh, other questions? Yeah, there's one over here on the aisle. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Michael Greenberger from the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, with regard to the proposition that banks know the economy, structure of the economy as well as regulators do, uh, uh, another point I think needs to be, we need to be reminded about the London whale when uh, one rogue trader, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, I believe in 2010 or 2011, lost $6 billion uh, at J.P. Morgan Chase. When it first happened, Jamie Dimon said it was a tempest in a teapot. The first assessment was that the bank had lost $2 billion. The CFO was fired because she could not get on top of what the losses were. In the end, the losses were $6 billion. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase had the in that case, did have the capital to sustain that loss. But a lot of banks uh, would have been, had problems with that kind of loss. And also, it was one rogue trader. If there had been many, the loss could have been much greater. Also, about banks understanding what's going on in the economy uh, in terms of uh, credit uh, risk, I'm reminded of long-term capital management in 1999, where 13 banks thought they were the only bank that was a counterparty and a lender to long-term capital. They were called to the New York Fed. 13 or 14 of them sat in a conference room and found out that each of them were counterparties and creditors to long-term capital management. And I do not think in the run-up to 2008, even in September, middle of September 2008, the banks as a whole understood what was happening in the economy. The regulators are better positioned today because one of the, uh, there's a lot of research that a major uh, destabilization in 2008 was the private nature of naked credit default swaps, that there was not a, a repository. Dodd-Frank creates a swap repository which federal regulators have access to, and they can look in that case about who is exposed to whom. And I do not believe because of uh, privacy concerns, confidentiality, that banks have access to who the counterparties are on every credit default swap that's entered into in the United States. But more important, I have a question to, for Dennis because there is a major theme running through the discussion that the stress tests and capital accumulation, uh, as I understand it, are so severe that it's favored shadow banking. 
and it's driven uh, these risks uh, out of the off the radar screen, uh, and therefore we're in worse shape today in that regard. What is your answer? Um, I, I think uh, Andrew and Greg bring up a good point, which we all need to keep in mind, which is risk migration. And uh, no question that uh, pre-crisis uh, regulatory arbitrage uh, resulted in massive risk migration from a more regulated banking system to a uh, less regulated to no regulated shadow banking system, including prominently the derivatives markets. And we're seeing that again today. I don't think, and, and I, I, it, was, it was almost a suggestion in the paper, it may not have been, that uh, banking regulators should be mindful about how tough they make regulation on banks, or you're going to push some stuff out of the, bank, the regulated banking sector, and, we should, and the banking regulators should worry about that. I would say no. Uh, banking regulators need to do what they need to do uh, on federally insured, Fed-backed, open window access banks. And if that causes migration of activities to less regulated areas, then you should be regulating those areas more. You should not be in any way decreasing the regulation in the banking sector. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, whether it's a... Um, you know, I worked in the United States Senate at the time when Dodd-Frank was passed, and I was involved in much of this, and there was a lot of discussion and agreement by the industry and others that we needed a um, regulator or a regulatory entity that oversaw, we got out of the silos and saw everything or had the responsibility duty to, to look at everything, and FSOC was created. No matter, now how, no matter how perfect or imperfect FSOC might be, the whole purpose of FSOC was to uh, address the regulatory arbitrage in the two-tier regulatory system between banking and non-banking and, and hit head-on the shadow banking system. Now, we can all talk about whether or not it was done well or right or whether or not the Fed should have had the responsibility for regulating the designated non systemically significant non-banks. We can argue about all that, but that was the point of it. And today, for all intents and purposes, and I know some people will disagree, but I think it's factual, FSOC is shut down. The shadow banking system is being revived. Regulatory arbitrage today is literally out of control and not regulated. And so there is a huge risk that Andrew and Greg have pointed out here. It should not, it, but under any circumstances, cause banking regulators to pull back to avoid that migration. It should cause everybody else to increase the regulation on systemically significant non-banks to stop the regulatory arbitrage. Okay, uh, yeah, right here, another question. Good morning, uh, I'm Morris Goldstein, uh, retired from the Peterson uh, Institute. Uh, I have a, a question to ask uh, Andrew, about two points he made uh, in his presentation. One was that his paper was independent of the question of the long-run right capital ratio for banks. And the second one was that a lot of the difficulties there might be resolved if we thought about longer adjustment periods. So uh, suppose one made the judgment that the right long-term capital ratio, let's call it the tier one leverage ratio for the eight GSIBs, was in the neighborhood of, say, 15% rather than the 8% that they have now. But let's think about that happening over a period of a decade. I mean, you could think of, you know, long-run adjustments in other areas like the fuel economy standard. It's been developed over a decade, right, in which the industry at the inception said, oh, well, this will be a disaster. It's impossible to do that. And yet, over a long period of time, we were able to do that. Yes, you have to deal with the migration problem where that would create, but why not think in that way, and why not think of the stress test as an instrument that would help uh, move toward that? A few years ago, I wrote a book on stress testing and bank capital reform, and I originally started out as thinking those are sort of two separate things. And then I came to the conclusion 
not too long that that was really not possible you couldn't really judge the stress test think whether they're useful if you didn't make a judgment about the current capital stock and we have a, a minimum stress threshold for the SLR of 3% and pure one leverage of 4%. If you think that makes sense, well, then when you see everybody pass, you have one judgment. If you think that's woefully low and that the, the, the peacetime uh, non-stress standard is woefully low, you come to another judgment. So anyway, I put those two. So it's an instrument for that, and if we learned over the next five years, you know, running all these stress scenarios helps us to see that the world is a much scarier place than we thought before. Maybe the overall level should be higher. That would make sense. That's not inconsistent with, with the way we frame our paper. Because what we were trying to pull away from a little bit here is um, the the general debate. So I, I, I don't... I, I'm not saying that, I'm, I don't want to mischaracterize what Dennis said, but there's a, there's a vein of what Dennis was saying that's consistent with the vein I hear from a lot of people, which is that, you know, this is the way we're going to keep the level of, of, this is the thing that currently bites. Stress tests are the thing that currently matter. This is the way we're going to keep the levels high. And I just wanted to try to separate from that intellectual debate. That actually, if we're going to talk about stress testing methodology, it should be in a world where we have somehow compartmentalize the question of the level. It could be that knowledge about that we gain from doing these stress tests for nine years perhaps is the most important thing that helps us in those level debates. <coughs> but the day-to-day -day and each stress test, I, I, I'm trying to avoid that. Does that make sense? John? Can I just quickly say, it erases the issue of the benchmark in which way you're looking. And Brian said this, quote, common equity uh, more than doubled since the crisis. Well, that's the wrong benchmark. During the crisis, the levels of everything were the lowest since the crash of 1929. The benchmark should not be, oh, we're so much better than we were when it was a disaster and everything failed. That's not the benchmark. Martin Wolf said uh, back in 2014, when people were talking about how much more capital they had, he said, look, three times zero is still zero. So, um, the question isn't, are we, do we have more than we had at the worst point in the last 100 years? Are things better than they were than they were at the worst point in 100 years? Well, gosh darn, I hope so. The question is, where should we be? Now, I know we can all disagree, some people can disagree about that. But that's the benchmark. We need to get away from talking about how we've got double this and double that and so much better than we were in 2008 when, we were st when you were staring a second Great Depression in the face. That isn't the benchmark. We should banish the entire comparison and start thinking about the right benchmark, which is where we need to be and how we get there, how we stay there, and who we're doing it for. So uh, my only follow-up would be, because um, obviously some statistics can um, have different angles, but when we look at where we are today, and again, all the investments that have been made and the severity of the stress tests and the overall capitalization of the system, you know, that is really what, at the end of the, when I go through all of my comments and ask and talk about recalibration, it's recalibrating that process because we've implemented and done an enormous number of great things in the last decade. Uh, from a regulatory reform perspective, but we do need to take a step back and look at how they all interact together to ensure we're getting to that right level. Okay, uh, we have time for one question, if it's a quick one. And, and they're bringing a microphone. Hi, Con Hurley, Online Lending Institute in Boston University. Um, there have been a lot of talk about wartime versus peacetime stress testing. To me, the different difference between wartime and peacetime is uh, the stress tests in 2009 
uh, were accompanied by a pledge by the government that it would fill the hole if the banks could not. Uh, that was the essential difference between the European uh, stress tests, which failed, and ours, which uh, succeeded. Uh, my, my, my question is that uh, perhaps we are uh, trivializing stress tests such that in the next financial crisis, can we go back and say, oh, uh, now we're going to do stress tests that really matter. Uh, when we've done the stress, stress, stress tests in peacetime for uh, successive years. Any thought, comments on that? A larger issue of our peacetime planning for war, which is effectively non-existent, in the, from a legislative perspective, I would say. That we haven't really, what we would need to do is what you just described, and we would need to have capital that was set aside in order to make that a credible stress test. I can't imagine such a thing would happen uh, again. Um, and, I would, uh, and, and I would think the fact that we haven't really thought it through in peacetime, what that wartime stress test would need to look like is gonna be a problem. So I'm agreeing with, <laughs> Your concern. No concern. Yeah. Me too. Okay, so we've reached the end of the time slot. Before uh, we break up, I'd just like to remind everyone that we're going to come back in here at 11 o'clock for the next session. And please join me in thanking the panelists.
but we're going to just keep moving, uh, moving forward with the, the rest of the agenda. Um, our second session today focuses on dynamism and transparency in stress testing. Our moderator for this panel, Beverly Hurdle, <clears throat> is Executive Vice President, Head of the Research Statistics Group, and Director of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In that role, she oversees a team that supports monetary policy, bank supervision, payment systems, and financial markets. Bev is a veteran of the stress testing program, having served as deputy chair of the Federal Reserve's Model Oversight Group, and has published numerous articles on stress testing and other banking topics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bev. Thank you, and a special thank you to Lisa and, and Bill and their colleagues for putting together such a tremendous uh, program today. Um, the uh, title of, of this panel is Transparency and Dynamism of Stress Testing. And to start us off, we have a paper by Mark Flannery. Mark is the Bank of America eminent scholar in finance at the University of Florida. And then uh, following Mark's presentation, we will have a panel discussion. We have three terrific panelists. Uh, in alphabetical order, we have Tim Clark, who's the former deputy director in the supervision and regulation division at the Board of Governors. I'm sure many of you know Tim. Uh, then we have Randy Gwynn, who's the head of the Financial Institutions Group at Davis Polk and Wardell. And finally, Andy Karitskis, who is the Chief Risk Officer at State Street. So with those introductions, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you very much, Bev. It's, it's really nice to be here, um, partly because I struggled with writing this paper, and now it's done. Um, <laughs> so that's a large part of why it's nice to be here for me. Uh, I got to go back, I think. Okay. Um, so th this is about transparency and model evolution, um, another word for dynamism. And what has gone on with uh, the, the CCAR process is a whole game-changing way to compute minimum capital ratios. So before the CCAR process, the idea was you look at your balance sheet, you multiply by Basel risk weights or your internal estimates of risk weights, um, and you get your capital requirement. And if you're a little bit short, they're, they're appeared from the outside. I can't say from the inside. They're appeared from the outside to be a somewhat leisurely process of converging toward uh, the, the required capital, or the required capital cushion. Um, and, and they talked about that a lot in the first um, session. Now for DFAST and CCAR, the first thing that gets an A++ is that they're forward-looking risk weights. They're not static risk weights, they're forward-looking risk weights that depend on the anticipated economic performance in the, in the, uh, in the economy and in the loan portfolio. However, the models are unknown, which adds noise to the process of managing a bank holding company's capital structure, capital planning. Um, and on top of that, and I think I agree with, with, with Andrew, this is very important. On top, of, on top of that, you're going to rectify deficiencies immediately. Not immediately, the week between DFAST and CCAR, you've got to rectify deficiencies. So there is uncertainty about the, the model, your capital requirement, and you've got to rectify it quickly. And those two things together have generated a lot of pressure uh, to know more about the model. Now, the way I think about this paper in the process is that we're balancing transparency against dynamism, that these two are, are in conflict, that the transparency, banks would like to know their positions, their required capital positions in advance. Dynamism, the stress tests have to change all the time. I mean, we've had a, a deep depression for nine years, and Okay, I get it. The large banks aren't going to, to suffer huge losses from deep depression. So let's move on if we think there are other risks to be uh, considered. And one of the big things I worry about is the APA. I was at the SEC for two and a half years, and I became deeply impressed with how much of a force for stasis is the APA and is the, the comment and, and uh, disclosure and comment process. And so that'll come implicitly in a lot of what I've got about to say. Now, before I start, let me make a background thought about costs. 
uh, before CCAR, there was an allocation of risks and there was an allocation of financial services across the various kinds of financial institutions. And then CCAR came along and raised minimum capital requirements, CCAR and some other things. Um, that raised the cost for CCAR banks, higher, higher cost of funds, relative to smaller banks and relative to non-banks. And so it's inevitable that we're going to get risks and services redeployed across the relevant institutions. And so one of the things that, that, that I want to do, and it'll be important when I, when I talk about the cost of uncertainty for the bank holding companies, is to distinguish between the private and the social costs of regulatory changes. So if the CCAR banks are making less C&I loans, that's not socially costly unless and until we establish that there's no supply of alternative C&I loan services coming from elsewhere in the economy. And sometimes when, when I read Basel documents, I read FSB documents, and, and I read uh, lobbying documents, sometimes people seem to not to distinguish between those two. But I think that's an important background for what I'll talk about in terms of the costs of transparency or the cost of opacity. So I'm going to talk about three kinds of transparency today, and then I'm going to make some uh, suggestions about how to incorporate new sorts of risks into model simulations. Not because I have any risks in mind, but as I thought about alternatives to the deep recession stress scenario, um, it, it became clear to me that this was going to be, require a qualitative change in the way we specify the risks. So what do the bank holding companies like about model transparency? It improves their ability to predict minimum capital. That means that the total required capital, the required capital cushion they've got to hold, is bigger on account of the uncertainty that the Fed's DFAS model overlays it. Um, but it's important here to point out that what the, the uncertainty is about is the total amount of capital. So if I can predict as a bank holding company, the total amount of capital, I don't really care what the Fed's opinion of this loan versus that loan versus another loan, what the risk weights are on the various components. So the, the need to hold extra capital is driven largely but not exclusively by the uncertainty about how much capital in total is going to be required. Now, how large is that cost? If you look at the stress test results recently, it turns out that the bank holding companies are pretty good at squeaking by just above the minimum requirements. Um, in the most recent year that just ended, two out of the 18 tested bank holding companies had to go back for a second bite of the apple, had to cure their deficits. One was six-tenths of 1% of risk-weighted assets. The other was one-tenth of 1%. So they got the second bite of the apple. Later on in the year, there is an opportunity. I don't know very much about the, the mechanics of this and how real this opportunity is. But later on, there's an opportunity if you wind up holding too much capital, you go to the Fed and you say, well, things have changed. I'd like to, to um, disperse some more of my capital. May I do it? So there's apparently an informal process for doing that. Um, and, and as I say, the, the banks are doing a pretty good job of hitting their minimums. So it looks to me as if the costs overall that come from this capital planning uncertainty are pretty minimal. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's easy for you to say. It's not your capital. Um, and I would be perfectly happy to be convinced otherwise, but, but my, my view of the situation is that those costs are not very big. What about the regulators? Well, the regulators want to have accountability. They want to have a certain amount of credibility with the public and with the banks. Um, the banks are, are quick to point out that all of the models and all of the scenarios would be better if the Fed would only accept some intellectual input from the regulated firms, but my guess is the Fed gets a lot of intellectual input from the regulated firms. So, um, you know, the, the, the notion of making the models transparent or the stress scenarios transparent because we want more intellectual consistency strikes me as, as probably a second order effect. But the important stories here, there are two of them. One is the Ofeo story. So if you don't know the Ofeo story, let me tell it to you. There was an act in 1992 um, Congressional Act, whose name is very long, it created OFEO, the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, um, Fannie and Freddie. And the stress test was specified in the statute. And the stress test was further, it was further specified in the statute that everything about the stress tests 
would be available in the Federal Register. Now, Scott Frame and a couple of co-authors wrote a paper looking at the, the, the stress test that started in 2002 and ended, of course, with the conservatorship in 2008. And they make a couple of interesting uh, observations. One, the data that went into the models for the, the stress test that Ofeo used was estimated, or the models were estimated over 1979 to 1997. No changes there, of course, between 1997 and 2002. But it was estimated over that model, and it never changed afterwards. And, and um, Frame and all placed the blame for never changing on the um, burdensomeness of complying with the APA sorts of comment and disclosure policies. Um, the other part of the, so the first part of the Ofeo stress test was lots of defaults. The other part was a 600 basis point parallel shift in the term structure. That's roughly what it was. Um, Dwight Jaffe has a paper where he, he looks at the, the, um, the term structure shift, and he said, well, what the agencies, what the GSEs seem to have done is immunize themselves against the parallel shift in the term structure and left all of the other potential shifts unhedged. So they were, there was lots of room to take risk that the model wasn't going to reveal. So the bottom line is that, that when we specified or overspecified the transparency of this OFEO model, we got bad models that didn't change and gave us bad results. So you could look at that model and you wouldn't really have learned what you need to learn about the capital adequacy of the GSEs. Now the other point um, to make is uh, the model monoculture. And, and first thing a banker says about the model mo monoculture is, my model's better than theirs, I'm not gonna use theirs, I'm not gonna change my portfolio. However, simple statistics says, if you're trying to predict something, and you have a model, and you have another model, the optimal prediction is a combination of the two models in inverse relation to how, what the standard errors the forecasts are. So it's perfectly rational that to some extent, all of the banks in the stress test, if they had a transparent view, they would use the, the Fed's model to make the predictions. And there'd be a little bit of the defast in everybody's credit allocations, and that's the sense in which I think of the monoculture, that, that it's going to um, reduce the diversification that we have across models in the private sector. And of course, all models are wrong, so um, when we add in a new model, we might get a better estimate, but we, we're not sure that we're getting to the right place. Now, in March of 2019, there was a dramatic change in the uh, information released. It was the first quantitative information provided um, in the form of credit card and CNI loan portfolios, sample portfolios, and, um, and loss rates. Now, I looked at that and I said, first of all, it's the first quantitative information. The Fed had been pretty cagey before that about giving qualitative information. It seems to me to be supplying hints about the parameters without actually telling us what the parameters are. And as I thought about that, and I thought about the way it's likely to go, the, the, the two words that occurred to me were slippery slope. Um, if you say to me, do I think this has gone too far? Um, my answer is maybe yes. Uh, if you ask me, do, would I like to go further in the same direction? My answer is probably not, because I'm very concerned about the parameters getting out for both of the, the Ofeo and the mono, model monoculture things. So that's transparency about the models. What about the results? Here I think the story is really positive. I really like the amount of detail that's given out. I wouldn't mind more detail. Um, the DFAST and the CCAR announcements continue to move stock prices significantly as recently as 2018. Um, I don't have the 2019 results. And they move stock prices not only for the tested banks but the non-tested banks. So they're telling us something about something fundamental of the banking industry. But I think the really important thing about being transparent about the results is that the day is gonna come when there's bad news to give. So far we've had good news, everybody passed or came close, but someday there's gonna be a large firm that doesn't pass or doesn't come close. And because of the, the tradition of being open about this, the Fed's not gonna be able to hide that. And so following the example, the SCAP, that one of the speakers this morning and the questioners referred to, following the tradition of the SCAP, the Fed's gonna to have to come to the market with a problem and a solution. Or they're gonna have more pressure 
to make the solution happen before the CCAR tests and they have to go to the market. So I view the, the transparency here as very important in part because it puts some pressure on the supervisors to act quickly and not to forbear for so long, which we have all sorts of evidence is, is not helpful. So, so I view that as, as sort of the, the second edge to the sword of, uh, of transparency. The scenarios, um, I, I'm actually not going to say very much about the scenarios. I don't care if the banks know them after the, uh, after the as of date. Um, I don't think they're worth much. You know, it's a deep recession. Two new kinds of stress shocks. Now we're in the dynamism world. Two new kinds of shocks that I've been able to figure out um, have to do with, first of all, um, yeah, it, it is not a deep recession. The deep recession is getting scaled, stale. So if I'm going to have a broader set of shocks to consider, and I'm not saying we need any particular one, but if I'm going to have a broader set of shocks or stresses to continue, I'm going to have to change the parameters in the models. And I'll explain why in a minute. And I also think we can make better use of the massive trading data that's collected. So why are we going to change parameters? Well, the PPNR, pre-provisioned net revenue, is a rich mine uh, to, to try to explore. Um, there are 24 subcomponents. This is all public information, of course. 24 subcomponents, eight loan interest income uh, ratios to total assets or risk weighted assets, nine deposit expenses, six components of non interest income, and three components of non interest expense, including op risk. Um, so when I think about that, I think about the richness of that specification, one of the first things I realized was that the importance of a stress shock to losses in the loan portfolio depends very importantly on how fast you increase your loan pricing as you enter into the stress scenario. So if, I, if, I, if we have two banks and I, I start to price up quicker than you do, then I'm going to have more capital coming in in the form of pre-provisioned net revenue, and I'm going to have a lower marginal uh, contribution to capital from, that's required from other places. Same thing with deposit rates. Um, same thing with changes in business models. So all of these things are going to require changes to the parameters of the model, not to the external variables like the interest rate and, and the real sector shocks. And that gets me right back to the APA. If I've got to go through um, a, a proposal and, and comment period for all of these, it's going to be very awkward and very unwieldy. Loan losses have the same thing. We talk a lot about, um, people frequently say, we ought to stress the banks to see if they're resistant to a kind of risk that hasn't shown up yet. So today, the poster child for that would be leverage C&I loans. The trouble, of course, is that you can't go to the data for information about those losses because the reason the sector is so big is because there haven't been big problems yet. So what you're going to have to do to assess the sensitivity of, of particular banks to this particular risk is you're going to have to shock the loss equation. You're going to have to move the intercept or change one of the um, speeds of adjustment or something like that. And again, I don't want the APA involved. The other way I think we could improve the stress test is to take the trading information, the massive amount of trading information, tens of thousands of, of Greek values, Greeks, provided by the, the large banks to the Fed. The Fed crunches the numbers and calculates total losses for each individual bank. That part seems to ignore completely the macro prudential implications of the banks having exposures. So I would really like to know what asset change has the biggest cumulative effect across all the banks. Okay, is there some kind of exposure that the banks are, are all long or all short? Because among other things, if the banks are long a risk, um, the rest of the economy is short the risk. So um, I, think, I think doing more with that would be uh, very useful. Um, I know it's a lot of data. It doesn't have to be done on the same time frame as the rest of the, the CCAR, but I think that's very much worth looking into. Then here's my one suggestion for, for making the, the test better, and some of you who know me won't be surprised to hear this. The DFAST takes an initial loss-absorbing capacity measured by capital and tracks changes in it through time. If the initial level is off, all of the other levels are off. And we know there are examples 
where the market value of, of equity has been way different from book value of equity. And so well, I'd, I'd like to suggest that the process start out with sort of a mini AQR, asset quality review, but instead of looking at the individual assets, I've got a formula here that says, why don't we just do something, for example, like the starting capital is the minimum of the book capital or a weighted average of book and market. So if market is really low, then it drags down the starting capital. But I, I do think we got to get some sort of market information into that initial condition. So um, Deb gave me the highlight, high, high sign um, summary. I think sharing the model, the parameters, is going to help the banks, but I don't see the cost that the banks are, are experiencing as being that large, and the sharing of the model is going to threaten the informativeness of the tests and perhaps invite sector-wide exposure to common risks. Um, I really like the commitment to continue full revelation. That's going to be important, particularly when there's bad news. Um, the stresses so far have gotten pretty repetitive after nine times. You know, how much do you need to know about a depression or a deep recession? Um, and new stresses are going to require changing model parameters, and that's a qualitative difference, um, not to an economist perhaps, but it may be legally a qualitative difference, uh, and that would be, I, I hope, a bad thing, because I think there's a trade-off there. And then the final thing I'll say, and I, I left a blank space in between to make it clear to you, I, I would re really like to see some market assessments in the stress tests, um, and I don't know exactly how to do it. I've talked to people for a long time but I think it's something that's worth keeping top of mind. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mark. Our first discussant is Tim Clark. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Oh, good to see you. Many thanks to the Federal Reserve for putting this on. Um, it's a bit of a homecoming for me. There's a million people, we have dozens of people here that I worked with for years, and I just want to make sure that I say hello and thank you to all of you continue to appreciate all the incredible hard work you do. Um, and I also want to reiterate uh, Dennis Kelleher's point about you know, the openness to hearing different perspectives. Um, and I hope that that will uh, continue to translate into considerations of the policy objectives and where we go from here. Because I think, you know, I've read all the papers. I think they're excellent papers. Um, and I think if you, from my perspective, if you, if you read all of those papers and you kind of roll it all together, uh, when I think about some of the proposals that are out there right now, both the formal proposals and those that have been discussed as maybe pending, they feel both to me uh, almost as unwise as they are unnecessary. Um, so uh, I guess you know where I'm coming from right from the start. Um, the, the, but you know, I'll, get, I'll get into some more specifics as we go. Um, I'd like to start also with the, well, let me say one other thing. It's very good to come after the earlier panel um, because Charlotte made some great points um, that I now can scratch from my talking points. Dennis made a number of points that I have already scratched from my talking points. Um, so hopefully I can get through this pretty quickly. But I do want to go back to the objective of this, which uh, as we all know, as Charlotte pointed out, is you know, to do all that can be done to reduce the likelihood that the banks contribute to, cause, or exacerbate uh, a downturn and turn it into something approaching the kind of horrible crisis we experience. And that's, of course, you know, often expressed as continuing to uh, lend through, throughout a downturn. If that's critical, but we should not forget that actually problems can come out of the banking system that can impact uh, and, and cause a downturn. And so constantly probing and thinking about the issues at the banks is, is critical, in addition to the very important aspect of just making sure they can, they can survive a, a severe stress and continue to function. Why is this so important? Well, Dennis, I think, made uh, exactly the right point about the incredible cost of the crisis. I will not repeat them other than to say I agree with what he said. They were immense. They were life-changing in many, many ways for many, many people and not for the better. Um, but there's a couple other things that I think are important. Uh, since the crisis, the toolkit that authorities have available to them has been weakened to some extent. There are actions that were taken by the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the U.S. Treasury uh, that would likely not be able to be taken again um, or be very difficult to get them. And, and I think that that's important. And I'm going to circle back to that when I talk about scenario severity and the difficulty of capturing what things would have really been like if the government hadn't stepped in. But me, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so I guess, um, you know, I, I should let me acknowledge that there have been advances in resolution and recovery preparedness, uh, certainly OLA and a lot of work done by the agencies and the firms. 
Um, my view is that's still completely a work in progress. The uncertainty about the impact of actually pulling the trigger on a resolution, uh, even in good times for a single bank, um, would likely make it, I think, a, a hard decision to make, and in bad times, for a num when a number of banks may be under pressure, I really think it will just have to be deferred. Um, so, having said all that, reducing the probability of default of the largest banks should remain the core goal uh, in support of the objective of where I started. The good news is, from what we're hearing, uh, we've heard from a lot of people, including today, and thank you, Brian, for your kind words. Good to see you. Um, the stress test has pretty much, the program, the totality of the program has been pretty broadly recognized as being useful uh, to the end of reducing the probability of default of the firms. Um, and, and in a couple of ways, making the firms think long and hard about their internal processes and be better at managing their risks and understanding the, the issues that they face. Um, as well as having the, the post-stress capital requirements. So that's, that's the good news. Um, and I guess what we're here for is, what kind of changes can the stress testing program withstand and continue to be effective? Um, you know, the rationale that for the proposed changes that I most often have seen, um, and I acknowledge that I'm sure there are other things I haven't seen, is usually couched in terms of making it more efficient. Now, you know, efficiency is, is a good thing, of course. Um, we all would like to see things be more efficient. But efficiency in uh, attempting to achieve efficiency by taking actions that may actually undermine the effectiveness of what has been a very effective tool to date, I think are of concern. Um, and I, and I, would, I would actually, you know, I think effectiveness should be the goal, uh, not efficiency. Efficiency is second order, though not unimportant. Um, so the proposed changes that have been, uh, that, I, that I, I mentioned, that have either been made public, you know, formally or are being considered, seem to fall basically in three camps. Reducing the volatility and uncertainty around the stress test results, that's basically what largely this panel is about. Uh, lowering the capital requirements for the banks, um, two things that spring to mind there is discussions of eliminating the pre-funding of dividends. Um, which I think would be a huge mistake, and I'll get to that later, uh, and removing the post-stress leverage ratio as a, as a constraining element of the stress testing program, which I actually think would also not be a good idea. Um, and then the third element, uh, the third piece, um, which is already done, which is, has been to reduce the pressure on the banks to maintain and continue to improve their risk management, internal controls and governance in support of their capital planning. Um, you know, I hope that through the, supervi the supervisors are, are, are great at their jobs. The Fed does have tools in the form of public enforcement actions and other things, uh, ratings, et cetera. Um, well, I wrote an op-ed about this. If anyone's interested, they can go back and read it. But the basic point is I think that you, the Fed has weakened its hand in the ability to hold the firms accountable for not making those practices stronger. And one of the papers for this conference actually has a little section in it that talks about the qualitative and seems to have come to the result from talking to a number of people that, in fact, as predicted, um, predictably, the, the banks will probably reduce the emphasis they put on this and stop trying as hard as they were before. And I think that's very unfortunate, and let's hope it's not true. Um, okay, so, so now, um, so those are, those are basically the way the, way the, pro the proposals lay out. Um, the Review of post-crisis innovations, I think, is incredibly important. I'm really glad that it's continued. Um, it started in 2015. Uh, we met with a number of banks, public interest groups, academics, et cetera, um, to review the stress testing program in 2015. Um, got a lot of very interesting and valuable input from those groups, which continues to float around. You know, for me, one of the things back then that I was struck by um, and, and perhaps others were, but I won't, I won't uh, even highlight who those others might be, was actually that the input we got from the banks hadn't really changed from the same things they were telling us were bad about the program when we first put the program in place, uh, which is to say that uh, they, they didn't like the concept of it, they didn't like the idea of it, and once they got over the shock that the supervisors and their bosses, the Board of Governors, were actually going to take this seriously, uh, they, they were... Um, had a few particular things they were concerned about, and, and those are the things that we're talking about today. So, so, so quickly on that, I just, you know, I'm, I'm also struck now that those same issues continue to be a, such a big issue and such a big topic of discussion uh, 
um, largely about being surprised and volatility of capital needs and et cetera. Um, and, and so that, that um, I just feel like we haven't evolved, evolved as far as maybe we could in that, in that sense, and, and, I, and I'd like to, I, I applaud Mark and his paper and the many things that he talks about at the end there uh, about ways in which we could, we could uh, make the test more dynamic rather than less. Um, I guess I would argue again with the, the, the banks, I think could be described as having benefited from this program. I think the banks are actually, they seem to be in pretty good shape. And, and um, the point of the program was not to benefit the banks, but, um, but I, I'm surprised that they continue to push back on the same issues, to finish my thought, um, when in fact, we've now had nine years of it and it seems to be going pretty well and it's pretty effective. You're looking at me, so I have how many, one, one minute to go? Oh gosh, this goes really, this goes really fast. So the key question, um, can effectiveness be maintained or enhanced uh, by making the test less dynamic and more predictable? I think that Mark's paper uh, makes a great case that there are many reasons to be skeptical. Uh, I worry about what's commonly referred to, uh, maybe somewhat lazily referred to as gaming the test, changing positions, moving positions, uh, the, the herd-like behavior that may result if all the firms try to just manage to the Fed stress test. Um, okay, I've got about, I'm only about halfway done, so I will actually skip straight to my conclusions. Um, well, I have to say one other thing, sorry, but I'll try to do this really quickly. On the scenario design topic, um, so Brian, you brought up the issue helpfully that lots of scenarios are good. The Bank of England has this, I think, a really good program in, in the scenario that they use on the off years. Uh, to test things out. Um, personally, I would just question why you don't then make the banks capitalize against it, but that's just me, um, and that's probably not gonna surprise you that I said that. Um, the, you know, in a perfect world, I think there would be, uh, to keep it dynamic, there would be a lots of shifting scenarios, and there'd be a lot of, of, of you know, different scenarios changing from year to year. But it's probably not really practical, and uh, I know that Lisa's staring at me thinking, you know, please don't recommend that we do lots of different scenarios. Um, and so I want to point out real quickly, because as the Fed makes this clear, but it's not often discussed, the Fed isn't trying to predict the, the future with their scenarios, not trying to predict the crisis. They're trying to calibrate capital needs so the banks will be able to withstand a, a range of crises. I think that's the right approach, given some of the limitations. I still think they could continue to use the salient risk feature um, of the Dodd-Frank uh, rule uh, to probe for new things, and I hope that they will continue to do so. Um, but one thing about the severity that I want to come back to, I mentioned at the beginning, and I guess I will end on this. The, there's, a lot, there's often critique that the Fed scenario is, to, is more severe than the global financial crisis. And as I mentioned earlier, the global financial crisis, um, you know, the, there was tremendous input from the authorities, some of which can't be done again. Um, but even if it could be done again, the banks should be required to capitalize, uh, should be able to internalize, required to internalize their externalities, as the economists would say. And so I would hope that the Fed could think about severity scenario, a uh, scenario severity, in a way, I don't know how you do this, that would try to strip out the benefits that the banks gained from all of the taxpayer-funded um, government government uh, actions that were taken in the crisis. So I actually don't think that it's right that this scenario is anywhere too severe. Um, and I, I think it'd be nice if we could probe ways to make it more so. So focus on increasing effectiveness. Don't forget the importance of the objective. And uh, last but not least, again, to Mark's point on, on transparency, I think the forbearance point is an excellent one. The more that, that can be done in public, uh, the better self-disciplining mechanism it is. Personally, I, when we talk about transparency, it's mostly about giving information to the banks. I'd like to see more information being given to the public. I think the public deserves to have a better understanding of both uh, the Fed's views on and actions towards uh, strengthening the banking system, as well as on the banks themselves. And um, I guess, with that, I will leave it, and clearly I've left out about 40% of what I was going to say. So um, hopefully we'll get some good questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Randy? So you're now going to hear the other view about the value of transparency. <clears throat> My thesis is that full model scenario and results transparency is essential to the public accountability, political legitimacy, and even the, 
continued independence of the Federal Reserve. Transparency is essential to the pro proper functioning of any democratic system of government. The public can't hold their elected of officials accountable without full information about what they're doing and how they're doing it. That's why the lawmaking process in Congress is open to the public and why laws enacted by Congress are published. That's also why the Administrative Procedure Act requires agencies to subject their rulemaking to public notice and comment and why regulations are published in the Federal Register. There are, of course, legitimate expect exceptions to the strong public interest in transparency, but those exceptions are generally very narrow. For example, Congress has created exceptions from the general presumption in favor of transparency for matters that would compromise national security. If the public believes that Congress or the President are hiding too much information from public scrutiny, however, the public can replace those representatives in the next election with individuals who are more committed to transparency. The public interest in transparency is even higher with respect to the actions of unelected officials such as the Federal Reserve principals and staff who are not directly subject to the public election process. Secrecy may be justified at the Federal Reserve, but in general, secrecy is only justified if it's necessary to prevent a serious, identifiable, and immediate public harm, such as a financial panic, or to encourage regulated firms to voluntarily share proprietary information with the Federal Reserve. And those justif justifications are only persuasive if there's not a more narrowly tailored means other than secrecy to prevent the public or firm's specific harm. While the U.S. banking regulators have long treated certain information developed in the supervisory process as exempt from the ordinary transparency requirements, my law partner Meg Tyre recently argued persuasively, in my view, in congressional testimony, that the modern explosion in what has been treated as the secrets of the temple or confidential supervisory information has made the historic balance be tran between transparency and, and secrecy untenable. Most of the secrecy is no longer justified by any legitimate need to protect the public against any serious identifiable or immediate harm. Instead, its main effect seems to be to insulate the supervisory process from public accountability. The lack of transparency undermines the public's confidence in the Fed's supervisory process, and if left unchecked, will eventually undermine the political legitimacy and independence of the Federal Reserve. As applied to the stress testing process, these principles mean that the Federal Reserve should provide full transparency into all aspects of its stress testing operations, unless secrecy is needed to prevent a specific, serious, and immediate public harm, such as a financial panic, or to encourage uh, firms to voluntarily share information. To its credit, the Federal Reserve has recently provided substantially more transparency about its supervisory models, scenario design, and stress testing results but the Fed has not provided full transparency out of fear that that might undermine the effectiveness of its stress tests. In their papers, professors Feldberg, Metric, and Flannery all seem to be against any further transparency and question the wisdom of some of the transparency already provided. Feldberg and Metric believe that further inputs, inputs transparency would enable banks to game the system, an argument that we've heard over and over again, at least I have. But in my view, gaming is a loaded word that's too vague to justify an exception to the strong presumption in favor of transparency. Much of what is labeled as gaming is indistinguishable from compliance. For example, when the posted speed limit is 75 and you observe cars driving at 74.9 or even 79.9 miles per hour, is that gaming or compliance? You say tomato, I say tomato. The Fed's narrower justification for secrecy based on a specific form of gaming is more persuasive, but it's not persuasive enough to overcome the strong presumption in favor of transparency. That's because there's a more narrowly tailored means that can effectively deter uh, banks from engaging in such ma uh, mani manipulative behavior. The Fed can issue a regulation against specific forms of gaming and impose MRAs, enforcement actions, or even fines on a bank if it detects such gaming. Like uh, Professor Feldberg and Metric, Professor Flannery is generally against any further transparency and even describes the Fed's recent disclosures about loss rates as a slippery slope toward the disclosure of equations and parameters. His first argument is that the benefits of further model transparency would not be significant to the banks because they're already pretty good at predicting required capital. But that description of the public benefits of further model transparency is far too narrow. Rather than focusing on the benefits to the banks, 
the focus should be on the benefits to the broader public, including the banks, academic experts, members of Congress, and the Federal Reserve principals and staff themselves. Such a broader view would show that the benefits include, first, making the Fed's stress testing process more accountable to the public, thereby preserving and promoting the Fed's political legitimacy and independence, giving the public, including academic experts, sufficient information to perform an effective evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of the Fed's supervisory models, giving the Fed the benefit of a more informed, credible challenge from the public, which should help it identify and correct weaknesses in both its supervisory models and the firm's company models, increasing public confidence in the stress tests, and helping the banks better understand the capital implications of their business decisions before they make them. Uh, Professor Flannery's uh, second argument is that the greater, uh, the, the greater model transparency would substantially reduce the regulatory value of stress tests and impede their dynamism. He also implicitly argues that subjecting the Fed's supervisory scenarios to public notice and comment would produce the same adverse effects. As evidence for these assertions, he cites Ofeo's ineffective stress tests of Fannie and Freddie on the eve of the 2008 financial crisis. According to one study, those tests were ineffective because Ofeo was required to provide, or in part, because they were required to provide full model and scenario transparency through a formal public notice and comment process. That process was slow, so slow and costly that it deterred Ofeo from updating its supervisory models or data in a timely manner, thereby re reducing the dynamism and regulatory value of its stress test. But this example is insufficient to overcome the strong presumption in favor of transparency. The Ofeo example doesn't provide a persuasive reason for assuming that the Fed would also fail to update its models and data prop promptly if it provided full model or scenario transparency. Let's be honest, OFEO was widely considered to be a weak regulator and was therefore replaced by the FHFA on the eve of the financial crisis. The most logical implication for, uh, most logical explanation for OFEO's failure to update its supervisory models or data was its weakness as a regulator, not the model or scenario transparency requirements to which it was subject. Similarly, there's no reason to assume the Fed couldn't limit the public notice and comment period for its supervisory scenarios to 30 days and promptly proceed with its scenarios as promptly as, as proposed or quickly adjust them. Moreover, the Fed is likely to benefit from comments that its proposed scenarios will have a disproportionate impact on some set of covered banks. The third argument is that increased model transparency would result in a mono model, mono model, model monoculture. <laughs> <laughs> that would lead to an increased correlation of assets. Um, but again, this reason is insufficient to overcome the strong presumption in favor of transparency. First, since the Fed's supervisory model already determines each bank's minimum capital requirements, there already is a model monoculture. Um, but contrary to conventional wisdom, that bias is a one-way bias in favor, in, in favor of low-risk assets rather than high-risk assets as long as the CROs of the banks genuinely believe that their proprietary models are more accurate than the Fed's supervisory models. For example, suppose that the Fed's supervisory model says a particular category of assets is more risky than, the bank, than a bank's proprietary model and therefore results in a higher capital charge than the bank would otherwise allocate to those assets based on its proprietary model. The bank will respond to the higher capital charge by reducing its exposure to the category of assets. Now suppose that the Fed supervisory model says that a particular category of assets is less risky than a bank's proprietary model and therefore results in a lower capital charge than would otherwise be allocated. Will the bank respond to the lower capital charge by increasing its exposure to this category of assets? I don't think so, um, as long as its CRO genuinely believes that its own model is more accurate than the Fed supervisory model. Um, and um, I will skip the for in the interest of time, I'll skip sort of addressing the final argument about the as of date because I don't actually think the dis, you know, disclosure of the global market shock before the as of date would provide any benefit. And I'm not sure that's realistic given that the purpose of the global market shock is to actually be, you know, to see how resilient the bank is in response to a surprising shock. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Andy. 
Well, I guess I'm batting cleanup today, but hopefully not on Lisa's Mets. So I'd like to thank the Federal Reserve for organizing the conference and inviting me to speak in this panel. As a risk practitioner, I'm a longstanding supporter of CCAR and regarded as the most powerful policy innovation to come out of the crisis. But in my experience, lack of transparency has been CCAR's Achilles heel and efforts to strengthen CCAR very much in sync with Vice Chair Quarles' proposals for CCAR's next chapter should focus on improving transparency. As I'll explain, keeping the banks guessing about CCAR's scenarios and models is not a public virtue. It leads to uncertainty, or what I've referred to in other contexts as the indeterminacy of capital, where banks don't know the regulatory costs of risk. I say this in full knowledge that others see more costs than benefits to transparency and would prefer keeping banks and the public somewhat in the dark about the design of CCAR scenarios and importantly, the models the Fed uses to translate scenarios into quantitative outputs for assessing banks. In particular, I see a different weighting of costs and benefits than Mark Flannery does in his paper. And I'm grateful to have Mark contribute to, uh, to this debate not only because he's an economist for whom I have deep respect, but because his paper has helped sharpen my arguments about transparency. In making the case for transparency, I'll try to respond to some of the excellent points Mark and others have made uh, in Mark and his paper and others in the contributions this morning. Just to set the record straight, like others, I fully endorse the view that stress testing was instrumental in recapitalizing U.S. banks and restoring confidence in the financial system post-crisis. I'm also a strong supporter of CCAR as a capital assessment tool. The question is not whether CCAR is a good idea, but how we can make it better. And despite CCAR's many advantages, its major shortcoming has been unpredictability associated with a lack of transparency. As Vice Chair Quarles has noted, there are two sources of unpredictability. First is the calibration of the CCAR scenarios, which determines the nature and severity of the CCAR stresses. And second are the models used by the Fed in their quantitative test, which for a given set of stresses, determine the actual losses for an individual bank. I'm gonna start by addressing the lack of transparency in the Fed models first, because this is where I differ most fundamentally from Mark and several others who spoke this morning. Through much of CCAR, the models the Fed has used to determine bank losses have been, in effect, black boxes. There's been limited disclosure of the general methodology behind some of the Fed models in various white papers, but not enough disclosure for banks to know with any confidence what the output of, of the Fed models will be for a given a CCAR scenario. Instead, banks rely on ranges of estimates and a fair degree of guesswork to predict the outcome of the Fed's quantitative test. In fact, uh, there's something of a cottage industry within banks of trying to build models to predict the Fed's model. Uh, but the reality is that uh, these uh, pr uh, predictive models often don't, uh, don't come very close. This is particularly true for the non-credit parts of CCAR, such as PPNR, OCI, balance sheet growth, and the trading and counterparty losses associated with the global market shock. The limitations of prediction can be seen in instances of mulligan use and conditional non-objections for the largest banks, the eight U.S. GSIBs. By my count, going back to 2012, there have been 16 instances of the GSIBs falling short in these categories uh, and, and coming up uh, short than in their, in their CCAR estimates. That's 25% of the time, which to me is an impressive miss rate. The result is that lack of disclosure of Fed models creates uncertainty. Without transparency, banks don't know the regulatory cost of risk. And since risk is a key factor of production, not knowing the regulatory cost of risk undermines balance sheet optimization, business planning, and sound capital management. It's a bit like asking companies to make investment decisions without knowing the effective tax rate because the IRS won't disclose the model it uses for calculating depreciation. The cost of uncertainty isn't limited to the banks that have had to use the mulligan to scale back their capital uh, requests. It's embedded in the capital cushion that all banks maintain to clear CCAR minimums, and it, ca and, it, and it cascades down from there to the inability of banks to know the cost of risk for individual transactions, hedges, asset classes, investments, 
and business strategies. And while this may be the bank's problem under BAU conditions, uncertainty could become a systemic problem in a crisis, or what Andrew Metric refers to as in times of war. Suppose a bank needs to de-risk its balance sheet because the economy is turned and it needs to conserve capital. Without model transparency, the bank won't know which assets to sell to increase its capital bu buffer for a given level of stress. The bank will have to wait for its de-risking actions to be run through the Fed's calculator to know what its regulatory capital position will be. Importantly, the Fed won't be able to anticipate how banks will respond to the need to de-risk either because the banks won't know how their actions will be treated under CCAR. Now, there are four main claims against transparency of the Fed models, which I'll address in turn. Claim one maintains that keeping the banks guessing is a good thing because it will force them to practice defensive balance sheet management and run with higher capital buffers. To me, if we want banks to hold higher capital buffers, we should raise them explicitly. Clarity is a virtue. I'd rather operate in a system with a known higher set of capital charges than an unpredictable set of capital rules that gets there by stealth. Claim two is about motto, mono coach, I can't say it either, model <laughs> monoculture. The notion that publishing the Fed's models would lead firms to abandon their internal models and adopt the, the Fed's model instead. Now, this claim ignores the requirement that banks use their internal models for their CCARB submissions and public disclosures of their results. Bank CCARB models have been built up over a nine-year period now, and they've been subjected to rigorous internal model validation standards and intense supervisory re review. The notion that banks are going to give up these internal models and just mimic the Fed overlooks these supervisory requirements, and of course it overlooks the bank's own self-interest. Banks do have an interest in adopting the best models for their own risk management purposes. Take, for example, PPNR. No regulatory model could do a better job of forecasting revenues and expenses than a bank's own models developed for, 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 its, for its budget purposes. It would be nonsensical for a firm to adopt the Fed's published PPNR model for its earnings forecasts rather than models that have been developed internally for strategic planning. And I think to a certain extent, the same can be said for interest rate, credit risk, and market risk models, all of which are used for other purposes outside of CCAR. Claim three is that withholding details of the Fed models prevents banks from managing to the model or, as we've heard before, gaming the system. I'm not entirely sure what we mean by gaming here. If the Fed thinks mortgage loss rates are going to spike in the next downturn, Shouldn't we want banks to take the Fed models into account in their assessment of risk? The worry seems to be that banks can exploit discontinuities in the Fed's models to lower their capital. And since no framework of model is perfect, every set of rules or models creates boundary conditions. But even where the Fed models may have discontinuities, it doesn't fall that it's in the bank's interest to exploit them to take on unwanted risk. Claim four, is that not disclosing the Fed's models helps ensure dynamism of the CCAR process. Dynamism is a good thing in CCAR, but, can it, but it can be achieved by the Fed varying the scenario inputs within defined boundaries for secret calibration rather than adjusting the models that translate the scenarios into quantitative outputs and then not telling the banks or the public about it. There's no reason why adjustments can't be made to Fed models as they are to firm models every year and disclosed to the public. Against these four claims, the lack of transparency in CCAR models is an exception to the general preference for known rules throughout the regulatory system. If uncertainty is good for CCAR, why not extend it to other parts of the regulatory framework? Would we be better off if the Fed applied its own liquidity models to calculate the LCR and didn't tell banks what deposit runoff rates it was using, or how it was measuring credit exposure under the SCCL, or if the IRS didn't publish the effective tax rate? These rhetorical questions suggest a high burden for CCAR's special treatment. Let me turn next briefly to the CCAR scenarios themselves. On, on scenario of design and calibration, I agree with Vice Chair Quarles that we should preserve the dynamism and salience of, of, of the stress tests while avoiding unnecessary volatility and CCAR surprises. We need to strike a balance between transparency and disclosure in a way that gives the Fed room to flex scenarios from year to year. In my view, we should aim for full transparency of the underlying philosophy 
of scenario design and calibration that sets the perimeter for CCAR severity. This would define the box for calibration, and then each year scenarios could be constructed within the box to test different vulnerability, vulnerabilities. But firms would know what the out of bounds are, and this can inform uh, their capital planning processes. Putting the scenarios out for public comment each year, presumably after the CCAR as of date, as Vice Chair Quarles has suggested, will help inform the Fed's thinking on scenario construction within the, within the box and avoid unanticipated outcomes. Let me wrap up. In closing, secrecy and unpredictability should not, should not be the principles on which we base our regulatory framework. As a risk practitioner, I see enough uncertainty in the world as it is. Adding an artificial source of regulatory uncertainty is not the way to make the financial system more resilient. When it comes to CCAR, as Vice Chair Quarles has advocated, we can do better. Thank you. Um, Mark, I just want to give you the opportunity briefly before we turn it to the Q&A portion to respond to any of the comments specifically about your paper that you'd like to uh, respond to, and then we'll have some discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, I did not use the word gaming um, because I agree that I don't know what that means. Um, I, I think the, the one comment that I'd like to, to respond to that is not directly about the paper, but um, Randy was talking about um, accountability. And as I read at one point the Dodd-Frank Act, I read it as Congress saying repeatedly to expert supervisors, we don't trust you to exercise your expert judgment. And when there's an expertise like that involved, I agree that people need to be accountable, go testify before Congress. But, but I think that uh, it's very hard for me to reconcile the concept of accountability with the notion that there is expertise that is specialized and hard for a large number of other people to understand. So, so I, that makes me raise questions. Um, and uh, as I say, there was a lot of stuff in Dodd-Frank that, that said that, that said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna let you guys in the agencies do what you think is best. We want you to do it our way. And I don't think that always worked out very well. So um, let me take the moderator's prerogative and ask a question to the panel, and then we'll open up for uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, in March, the Fed released an 80-page document uh, describing the supervisory stress test models and providing projected loss rates on hypothetical corporate loan and credit card portfolios. Several of our, our speakers referenced the document. I think Mark, uh, at one end of the spectrum, called it the slippery slope. Randy at the other end maybe said it was not nearly enough. So uh, turning uh, to, to each of you, um, uh, if you think about the different constituencies, the different audiences for that document, uh, the banks participating in the stress tests, analysts who want to understand the stress tests, uh, the general public, anybody who wants to think about financial stability questions in, in the US, academics, how well did that document do at providing information that's helpful? Where could it do more? Where did it do too much? I'm not sure if you're pointing at me, Bev, but I'm happy to start off. <laughs> okay, you were. Okay, great. So I'll start off, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to guess that you can guess where I am on the uh, March dis uh, uh, disclosures. Um, I think the March disclosures were a step in the right direction, but ultimately uh, not sufficient. And why were they not sufficient? Because the acid test of disclosure to me is whether the banks can um, use the disclosure to build models that are going to be able to predict the Fed's outcome to within a very narrow range. Let's call it plus or minus a few percentage points. Um, because I don't think that there were to be a mystery in the process when it comes to the models that translate the scenarios into the quantitative outputs. And I think... Um, the March disclosures still left enough mystery there so that uh, the banks can't do that. They might, they might be able to do a reasonably good job of that now in some of the credit portfolios uh, for or credit asset classes for which model portfolio results were shown. Um, that may get pretty close, but there's a lot of CCAR uh, outside of the loan books. Uh, we talked about PPNR. There's, again, you know, uh, the treatment of other comprehensive income, deferred tax assets. Uh, there's operational losses, 
uh, all of these components really aren't addressed in the kind of detail you'd need to be able to build models that are going to come quite close, very close, to uh, the Fed's models. So to me, the asset test is, can the banks do that? And I think the answer is still no, at least not for, for many of the core components of CEQA. So, so let me, I'd like to actually put the March report in the context of a whole bunch of other initiatives that the Fed has done in the last year and a half or two years that I think are quite remarkable that that um, been in the direction of further disclosure. So the, the three February um, transparency notice uh, documents, the March, the, the, 19, the 2018 and 2019 results of the CCAR and DFAS stress testing. Frankly, the financial stability reports and the supervision and regulation reports have all kinds of information that has been secrets of the temple for too long. I think this is all really good, and so I, I don't want to sound ungrateful, because I think these are all really great things, and the, and the March report include a lot of useful information. But I still think I don't see the justification for continuing to hide the ball. I'm not saying that there aren't justifications. Maybe someone can come up with one, but I haven't heard one other than these vague things about gaming or some of the other ones we talked about today that I just don't find persuasive. So I'm open to hearing a persuasive one, but I don't think it is. And if, unless there is one that someone comes up with, I think that full transparency is what the Fed should do. So my view is slightly different than the other two, but um, <laughs> the, um, I guess I would, at this, my, my, so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. It's a difficult question, frankly, this question of, of how much to disclose, and I understand that I'm certainly not going to get into an Administrator's Procedure Act um, debate with a lawyer, very fine lawyer sitting next to me. Um, the, at this point, I think actually where the Fed needs to focus on for the continuing dynamism is frankly in the scenarios. Um, but I do, th but I do, because I think I think that I think it's past the slippery slope. Personally, Andy keeps trying to convince me that they haven't reverse engineered models. We had this earlier in another conversation. I, I think that the that some of that mystery is lost. I think that's unfortunate, but I, because I think dynamism is very important. Um, so I guess I would get to, I would focus on the scenarios and having as much dynamism in the scenarios as possible. I'm not sure we're, they're holding that much left on the models that it matters that much at this point. But let me add, say to that, if anything about disclosing the models slows down the process of the Fed upgrading, updating, and evolving those models when they discover that they may be missing something, I think we have a real problem. And I think that's where some of the concerns about this come in. Um, this gets back to the GSE issue. Um, where you can agree or not with how Mark portrayed it in the paper, but, but the Fed should have the capacity to identify ways in which it can enhance its measures, and it should be able to use those um, as rapidly as possible because there's no margin for error with these firms and get back to the objective of making sure that they don't create another crisis. So, um, yeah, I, I agree entirely that, uh, that the issue is do you want the firms to have the models or not? And I think that what happened in March was sort of a halfway step, and just bound not to make everybody happy. Um, the uh, notion that, that we could have a, a comment, a, a notice and comment period, with say a 30-day comment period, um, you know, Randy's firm writes a lot of those comments, and there are people inside the regulatory agencies who read them and then try to figure out what to do about them. So the delay, even if the comment period is 30 days, the delay is substantially longer. And I, I think that uh, the, the notion that um, we give away too much of the model information creates the potential for a huge number of arguments about whether the capital ratios are too high or too low on individual securities, um, which I, I think is ultimately not part of the stress test but I think it would, it would bog down, perhaps bog down the stress test dynamism. Just one follow-up on that. I just want to make it clear. I am not arguing for, <clears throat> uh, you know, subjecting the models to the, necessary to the Administrative Procedure Act. It's more the spirit of the Administrative Procedure Act, of public notice and comment. It can be shorter. If there's an emergency that means the Fed should move quickly, you know, there could be an exception to that period. Um, it could be that the notice comment period you know, goes on beyond a particular cycle so that it, it applies to future cycles. Um, but I think the real thing, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's a public notice and comment process if implemented correctly that's going to 
that's going to eliminate dynamism in the Fed's models. That's a question of the Fed's backbone. And I am completely convinced that the Fed has backbone. I'm not convinced that Ofeo had backbone. But as long as the regulator actually has backbone and believes in the models, uh, believes in the stress testing process, which I think the Fed clearly does and should, then I don't see why an appropriate input from the public um, has to be something. I don't see that it necessarily, you know, interferes with dynamism. Quick, quick, quick response on that. So, uh, all excellent points. I guess one of the things that I, I, I meant one of the forty percent, one of the pieces of my forty percent, I didn't get to um, up there, and maybe that's even maybe it was more than forty percent. Is that you know the? I don't know if it's a backbone issue per se. It, it, it seems when I was talking about the firms and what they've been wanting for all these years, it, and I and I think it's safe to say, and Andy, you can shake your head over there, over there, and, and, and you know. Um, so far, nodding. Um, I think it really comes down to actually stability, right? It, it is lack of dynamism. They want to turn the. I, I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. There is some desire, I think, to see the stress test turn into a very complicated type of fixed risk weighted asset program um, that may be a better risk weighted asset program, but it doesn't change very often. And I worry about that. And I think that since that is part of what's pro propelling some of the changes, whether the Fed has the backbone or not, and I believe the Fed has a lot of backbone, I think you might get into a cycle where it would, they would find it very difficult to actually make changes that led to significant uh, volatility in the post-stress capital requirements. And that could lead to, again, a desire not to move quickly to, to make changes to the processes or the, or the scenarios. That's really one of my true concerns about all of this. Uh, I think they need to move quickly at, at all times. So I was just going to ask uh, Tim or others, um, can you not get the dynamism that you're looking for from the scenarios and varying, varying the shocks and the scenarios, again, within a defined perimeter? It seems to me that that's the place to look for dynamism and responsiveness. And if we want to test new vulnerabilities, let's do it there. But why do we need the uncertainty in the models that convert those uh, stress inputs to outputs? That I'm not, you know, I'd like to get your perspectives on why you need the uncertainty there as opposed to putting the dynamism in the first part of the equation. Yeah, I, I, I you know, one of, one of the arguments that I tried to make, which, which maybe it didn't come through, is that the, the range of stresses that can be implemented through the current stress scenario is very limited. Why? Because because the models inside the, the, the black box all look at interest rates and unemployment rate and various components of real output. But it's a very small number of, of, of variables, and we know that historically they all move together. So if you're going to confine yourself to those sorts of, of external stresses, I don't, know, I don't know, I'm sure people can be more imaginative, but I don't know how dynamic we can get if we confine ourselves to those sorts of stresses. So, I, I think that changing some of the model parameters is going to be an important part of exploring beyond the kind of deep recession shock that we've, we've administered repeatedly. All right. Uh, why don't we turn it uh, open to the audience? I assume there's microphones. And um, if you have a question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. So there's one right down here in the front. Oh, okay. One in the back and then in the front. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Marcus Stanley from Americans for Financial Reform. Uh, and I guess uh, it's, it's always very interesting to hear people who, uh, who want the stress tests to be more stable or, frankly, more static uh, talk about dynamism or, or frankly, uh, give lip service to dynamism. I mean, I mean the stress tests are already uh, fairly static. Over the last four years, uh, if you look over the last four years, uh, the total loan losses or the, the uh, estimated loan portfolio loan losses have been right around 6% every year. Uh, the estimated trading losses from the counterparty and, uh, and trading shock have been 90 to $110 billion every year. Uh, and that's pretty much for, for four years in a row. So we're already looking at a fairly uh, stodgy stress test, I guess. And I, I just wanted also to underline what Mark said about uh, that you, you can't uh, 
get dynamism from the scenarios alone, because the question is, are these scenarios going to be translated into losses in a way that we uh, have not seen before? Because that's, that's what happens in a financial crisis, is that uh, macro, um, that macro, the macro situation is translated into losses in a way that people have not previously predicted. And as Mark said, that, that's got to come from the, the parameters and the model. Uh, so I guess just uh, to turn this into a, a question to Andrew, uh, I was going to ask this question, but Tim kind of then stated it. Um, you said very clearly several times that banks need to know in advance uh, the capital weights for their assets. If the banks do know in advance the capital weights for their assets, then isn't this just another form of risk-weighted capital? Haven't we just turned it into risk-weighted capital? Yes. Yeah, so. I don't think that um, knowing the, the weights that come out of the models makes this an RWA exercise because they're really, they're, they're, they're two components here. Um, there's the scenarios themselves and then there's the translation. And the scenario, uh, it, despite uh, you know, your, your review of the record, which says that it's relatively static, the scenarios actually do vary quite a lot uh, year on year and they test different vulnerabilities. That's certainly true in the global market shocks, where you've seen tremendous variation from year to year. And even um, if you look at things like the shape of the yield curve in 2018 versus 2017 and 2019, substantial differences. And when I've looked at the last three years, um, the uh, CCAR losses as a percent of uh, CET1, uh, you know, common equity tier one capital in 2017, I think, Average 28 um, percent. The jump to 36 percent in uh, sorry, that is in 2017. It jumped to 36 percent in 2018, and back down to 27 percent in 2019. That's a pretty big uh, degree of variation, and that all came presumed, and that came mostly from scenario design, not from changes in the models. So I think you can get big differences on the scenario side. So I don't think it's an RWA in disguise. We have a question down here. Thank you, Dennis Keller from Better Markets. Uh, Randy, I have to tell you, I teared up at your advocacy of uh, uh, full transparency and public interest. Um, in fact, you know, we've got openings at Better Markets. Uh, a couple of comments. One is the uh, apparent use of the public input um, as a synonym for the industry should be thought about. In the APA, yes, there's supposed to be public input. But on stress tests, like derivatives and others, it is 99.9% .9 industry input. And we saw how the industry used the APA process to slow down, kill, rule after rule after rule, and then when they didn't get what they want, then litigate it. So to say that the a you could use an APA or an APA-like process in a relatively quick way when you're opposing the industry is just factually incorrect, and the record is replete with examples of that. Um, but in taking the prioritization of uh, transparency to the extent it seems like some of you are, are saying, I assume that means two things. One is all the banks agree, will agree to disclose their proprietary models and inputs. After all, the public needs a holistic picture of what's going on. And if the public is going to hold the Fed and, elected, and regulators accountable, Shouldn't they also have the ability to hold the banks accountable for what they're doing? It, after all, that's where the taxpayer money is going to go if this process fails. So it seems to me that there has to be complete and total transparency is the logical extension of your argument. And secondly, in terms of transparency, it's interesting that the banks fought tooth and nail on any transparency for the bailouts in 08 and 09. Lawsuits had to be filed. We had to put a provision in Dodd-Frank mandating the Fed disclose all the backdoor bailouts, the front door bailouts, the rescues, and the use of the rescue programs. And so it seems to me to say, when we're in the middle of the crash, and taxpayer dollars are being funneled to the industry, and the Fed is putting trillions of dollars into the industry, don't tell the public a thing. And then fight for years after that to make sure the public doesn't know. But to then say, in peacetime, or whatever you want to call it, in 2019, 
by golly, we want a one-way street here on transparency. It, it seems to me that it's a double standard that now the argument for transparency benefits the industry and that's why you want it, but when it doesn't benefit the industry when they're getting the bailouts, no transparency. Anybody see a problem with that? Well, it's always easy to create a bunch of straw men and attribute arguments to people that people have never made, but um, no, I do, I do think that transparency should be the presumption for the Fed and for all, all uh, uh, organs of government, unless there's a justification you know, based on public harm that, you know, such, as a, such as trying to prevent fostering a financial uh, panic or something like that. Um, and so I do think there needs to be public transparency. I, I think it's not the same when you're talking about private you know, businesses versus the public. That, that's not part of the government. On the other hand, I think there's probably a halfway point in terms of transparency you're talking about because it does strike me as reasonable for the Fed, and they've done this in other areas in some reports, to, d to disclose aggregate information about what has come up from the, um, uh, the firm models or even to the extent they can do it without it being, you know, if they can do it on an anonymized basis, even ranges and averages and things like that, if that can be done in a way that's consistent with, I think, the you know, private competitive interests of the banks involved, yeah, it strikes me that that might be useful information. Can I make a, re can I make a really quick point before we sure. move on to just the very <laughs> first part of it? Because like, I think Dennis does raise a really important point, at least important to me. The, the engagement with the public in the notice of public comment um, is a, just a challenge in this particular area and in many areas because of the complexities of the issues involved. I, I want to um, actually thank Dennis uh, and Marcus and you know, AFR and Better Markets for the work they do to try to make to get, get people to understand and put that in there. And I guess I would encourage the Fed to find ways to get more engagement with the public, to get more input from them in this process. I, I don't know exactly what the answer to this is, but I think it's very important. I'm, I'm glad Marcus raised it, because frankly, the public in this, in this business usually is the banks and a few scattered groups trying to take the other side, and the academics. So, well, but anyway. So anyway, I, 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 would like to, I would just like to see the Fed, and hopefully you know, um, you'll find ways to, to get greater public engagement on these kind of topics. And this was a great start, but again, we're mostly bankers and specialists here. Yeah. Francisco Colvis from the Bank Policy Institute. Um, this question is, is for Mark. Uh, when you mentioned about the social costs of, uh, so meaning there's a huge literature right now documenting migration of riskier lending out of banks to non-banks. And I think there's still the jury out there in terms of whether the quantities are being impacted, but clearly the pricing is being impacted. And also clearly, you know, the trends have been significant and these institutions are unregulated and we really don't understand the risks they are taking for many of those cases. And, and this is both on the corporate as well as on, on the household side. So when you say it's, there's no social costs, I mean, I think we are to think deeply about these, these trends and, and, you know, what is the impact of stress. I'm not saying everything is driven by the stress test, but clearly the stress tests have, have a very uh, important effect. Now, so this is the, the question for you. I just wanted to say a, another remark is, I, mean, I think we've seen, looking at the last six or seven years of stress testing, you know, the results have been, the, the scenarios continue to be extremely severe, and the peak to trough decline in, the, in losses has been lower. And of course, you know, we, we a bank analysts, meaning we spend a lot of time trying to think how much is driven by the severity of the scenarios changing, as well as the Fed models changing, as well as the portfolios of the banks changing. I mean, I think it would be a, a tremendous help for the industry and everyone to understand better, you know, as we've looked over the last six, seven years, meaning how much of the stress test made the bank's portfolio so pristine and how much has migrated out of the banking sector. So, I mean, in another way, just decomposing the changes every year, say, call it the SCB, the peak to trough decline in capital ratios, how much is driven by these three key components. I would be surprised that bank models play a huge role, and I think that's really a key issue because, you know, that just insert inserts a lot of volatility uh, in banks' capital requirements, and as was mentioned today, meaning we know from economics that the volatility leads to underinvestment, and so I think that's, that's a very important issue. Well, thank you, thank you for those thoughts. Um, 
you know, I think I, th I have been saying for a long time that one of the reasons I don't like higher capital ratios in banks is because it will drive business elsewhere, and I don't know where the business and the risk is going to go. Um, I think we have very bad information about where the business goes. Uh, on the other hand, if, if what we find is that, that uh, the business that stays inside the banks after the stress test rearranges risk allocation, um, I believe it ought to be the stuff that's riskier. I think the safe stuff is easier to securitize and push somewhere else. And so I think what you're describing, in a sense, is, is um, a, a symptom of the rearrangement of risk bearing in response to changing financing costs. So, but I agree with you entirely that, that, that the, the pushing the business out of the banking system, where we know it sort of works, into someplace else where we're not sure it works, has risks involved. And I've always counted that as one of the costs of higher capital ratios. And to, to that, if I could again, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep coming back to Dennis, because actually I thought Dennis made a number of tremendous points in his earlier comments. Um, the fact that it's not regulated well outside of the banking sector does not mean it shouldn't be regulated well inside the banking sector, right? So I think I, I, I understand the concern about systemic risk propagation. I think the answer to that is actually greater oversight um, and, and, you know, work understanding where it's going. And, and so, you know, uh, it's hard to, when you see re administration with recommendations, a couple, you know, weakening the OFR um, and the FSOC, um, with uh, with these kinds of things, oh, I'll stop there. And, uh, Dale Brainerd, um, I thought uh, Andy, your comment uh, was interesting uh, that you would rather operate in a system with higher uh, capital requirements uh, that are predictable uh, than. Uh, have the kind of unpredictability that you have um, talked about with regard to the stress test. So I'm just be very interested in hearing a, a sense of what the magnitude of that trade-off is, both from you and <laughs> I'd also <laughs> want to hear from, um, from uh, Tim and uh, from Mark um, as, as you think about what that would look like in terms of safety, soundness, and financial stability, you know, what would be that kind of higher through the cycle capital uh, equivalence. Well, here I'm going to retreat to um, Mark's uh, comment that, uh, and maybe there's also Andrew Met Metric, that's devilish devilishly hard to come up with a cost-benefit analysis of how much capital is enough. Um, so I don't have the answer uh, to your magnitude question. Uh, but uh, I, in, in all seriousness, I do think that uh, if the reason we're keeping uncertainty in this system is because we want an uncertainty buffer and we really want banks to just hold more, more capital, then we should just do that explicitly. And we should be, you know, be clear about it and have a system of known rules and uh, allow banks to operate then within that system. So if we think the current minimums are too low, let's raise them. If 4.5% you know, is too low and we think 5% is better, let's have that debate and let's raise them and let's move on. But I think to keep it um, in this state where you don't know its volatility, its uncertainty, and you don't know how much the buffer, how to size that buffer throughout the annual capital planning cycle, I think uh, really leads to all the, uh, you know, all the ex inefficiency I was talking about beforehand. So I would much prefer a system where we had that debate open and explicitly. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, I, I, think, I think that carefully looking at the past nine years of stress tests, we could get an idea of how much excess capital the banks are holding in order to protect themselves against this uncertainty. And I think on average, if Andy were average, which of course he's not, he's much better than average, but, <laughs> but if Andy were average, he'd take that as an estimate of, of um, how much extra across the board capital he'd be willing to take. So I think we could get an answer to that question. Um, by being careful and subtle in evaluating the, the misses in the, in the past capital structure. So, yes. yeah, and I, I suspect that that's true. We could get an answer to it. Um, I think that if we did get an answer to it, 
it would probably, you know, have to include a lot of the type of analysis currently carried out in the stress testing program to figure out what the right number is, um, and if possible, uh, maybe increase the confidence we take away from the post-stress uh, minimums right now um, and say the post-stress minimum should be higher, factor that all into a large calculation, you can come up with a through the cycle number, I think. I don't think the industry would be particularly happy with it, to be honest, but, um, but we could give it a try. I wanted to just respect real quickly on the uncertainty question. I, I struggle with this one because, you know, I know you don't want the Fed's re capital requirements to become a new source of uncertainty, um, but the world that you operate in is tremendously uncertain. So it's almost as if you're asking the Fed to create an artificial uncertainty by saying this is the number it has to be and it shouldn't vary. Um, or and maybe I'm wrong, maybe, maybe I'm conflating a little bit, but, but I, want to be, I want to understand a little bit better. Yep. I turned that exactly around, Tim. So I think we do live in an uncertain world. As a risk practitioner, I experience that every day. And my, my pleas, let's not add an artificial source of uncertainty, which is uncertainty about the Fed's models. That's an entirely invented, manufactured source of uncertainty. Why do we have to deal with that in our capital planning exercise? We all know the world is uncertain. There's enough uncertainty out there. That's my point. Right, but you, uh, we can't, we could go back. We could go back and forth for a while. Uh, Adjusting the models that are appropriate, you would agree with that, right? If the Fed identifies a problem with the model, and it, okay, so it's not static models. It's just more transparency on the model. Well, I think looking at the clock since the next, uh, the next uh, agenda is, is lunch, uh, we will call it there. Thank you very much to Mark and to our panelists for a wonderful discussion.